Hello, hello everyone. My name is Dave Casuto, instructor for Learn It, and welcome to our Intro to InDesign class. Well, I bet you're wondering, what will I learn in this class? What does this class have to offer? Well, we are just going to start from the basics, understanding the InDesign workspace, move on to creating new documents from scratch, to drawing and manipulating shapes, then moving on to applying color, understanding and implementing basic and complex topography. And then we're gonna get into a fun series of lessons on placing images, image editing, and text wrapping images. We'll then do a deep dive into paragraph, character, and object styles, an absolute must for any level. And once we're done with those, we explore the amazingly valuable master pages. And then finally, we learn about how to export and package our documents for publishing. Now, this course is designed to be an interactive, hands-on course. So occasionally, you'll hear me say, pause the video and practice on your own. So make sure you download the class files from the link below to do so. This will ensure you get the most out of the course and learn the program in a more experiential, hands-on manner. I look forward to teaching you all the cool things that InDesign has to offer. So stay tuned and get ready to learn. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our off-site community. The link is in the description as well. And as I mentioned, this course does have exercise files and you'll find them in the video description below. Let's begin by first understanding what InDesign actually is. Technically speaking, InDesign is known as a layout program. So we can lay out text and images and graphics uh, to make books, to make magazines, posters, newsletters, brochures, proposals, annual reports. So we can see here as an example, just everything's just kind of laid out with all of our content that we may be using other programs to create the collateral to put into this. So in other words, we have InDesign that takes all of the content that we may have created in Photoshop, that we may have created a logo inside of Illustrator, and we brought it into InDesign to create our books, to create our magazines, Okay, where Illustrator is designed for illustration, for creating graphics using vector-based technology to draw out a logo, draw out some animations and things like that. So if we go over to here to any of these here, you can see some of these images were doctored up inside of Photoshop and then brought into InDesign. Okay. And you can see how I can make a nice little magazine, but a lot of these things were done inside of another program and then brought into InDesign. Okay. So again, could be a book, could be a magazine, could be a poster, you know, things like that. But a lot of the work was done in Photoshop. Now that said, InDesign does have a lot of tools that Photoshop has, has a lot of the tools that Illustrator has. Not as many, but there is some kind of Venn diagram-y sort of overlap between all three programs. So we could do some things to this photograph if we wanted to, to make it you know, like have a, a special effect on there, have a shadow on it, you know, we can put a shape around it and all that good stuff. And then if we wanted to actually draw out some vector graphics inside of InDesign, we absolutely can do that, all right? So we do have, again, some overlap between all three, but ultimately you can see here that this is multiple pages and it's designed to be laying things out like this to have individual pages on here with headers and footers, and maybe an index and a table of contents and things like that. So it will differ from the other Adobe programs giving us that type of uh, functionality. All right, so we're gonna be exploring everything, everything you need to know within InDesign, or at least in this beginner's class, it will be an advanced class after this, but we're gonna be exploring kind of what those differences are, what the benefits are, what the power of InDesign is, as well, but I wanna just at least kind of get some definitions out of the way so you understand kind of what's what, what's not what, and what tools are used to accomplish what goals. All right, so stay tuned and we will start our first lesson. Let's begin by understanding the interface and the workspace 
that InDesign provides for us. So we can really sort of understand what we're looking at, what things are called, how we can customize things, move them around, and kind of take ownership over the program. Now, this was probably going to change for you as you move throughout the program, as you start to develop more learning. But let's just see what we're looking at at first. Now, you'll notice over here in the upper right, I have something that says Essentials. This is the name of the workspace that I am currently in. This is what InDesign has given to me, right, as a workspace I can work with. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And you can see I have a number of different workspaces I can go through depending on what projects I'm working on. And these are all just things that InDesign has given me. OK, now, if you're in Essentials and yours does not look like mine, go ahead and click on the drop down and choose Reset Essentials. So then everything looks like how mine is looking at. So you're going to see here we're going to do this because I want everybody to more or less be on the same page for the rest of our lessons. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to start customizing this. Some of these things we want, some of these things we don't. Some of these things we want to look a little bit different. We want to have them someplace else. So what I'm going to teach you next is really going to help you really understand how you can take ownership of this program but also guess what when you start working with photoshop illustrator and some of the other adobe programs you'll see that manipulating and taking ownership of the workspaces is essentially going to be the same process so the first thing i'm going to work with is this guy over here which is my tools panel and i'm going to find that little dude right there that little double-sided arrow and i'm just going to go ahead and click on it why because i'd rather have this to be instead of one column two columns we're going to be exploring a whole chunk of these here, so hang tight with that. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to come over here to the right-hand side where we have these other panels. We have our Properties panel, we have our Pages panel, we have our CC Library, and you know nothing much, frankly, after that. So I need to add on some more. I need to take away some other things on here. So let's say, for example, I don't want the CC Libraries, okay? Not really relevant for me right now. So very simply, all I do is right click on it and you'll notice a whole bunch of options comes up. I'm gonna click on close because I don't need that anymore. Okay, I'm gonna show you how we can get it back so don't worry about it. And you'll notice here I only have pages and I have properties. Okay, click on that, activates that, click on that, that activates that. All right, so very straightforward. Now, those are all the panels I currently have but I know I wanna use a lot more than this in the future. So where do all my panels live? They live inside of the window window. OK, you can see here is window up on top. All right. And when I click on window, you will see all of the panel options I have available. And you can see it's nicely organized in alphabetical order. Love that. And you will see that a lot of these have little sub menus here. So like color has a lot of extra things in there. You'll see also, so does object and layout. So does styles, a big thing that we're going to be talking about here. You'll see that type and table also have a lot of things in there. So keep an eye out for these because in case you're not seeing what you want, there's a good chance it's kind of hiding here. All right, so what are some things that I may want to bring up? So I definitely are going to be working with styles. So I'm going to click on styles and I'm going to choose paragraph styles. And this pops up for me and it's just kind of floating there. All right, that's pretty cool. That's fine. I'm going to deal with that later. Over here to window. And let's say I want to work with color later on. I'm going to click on color. Oh, and that does something interesting. You'll notice here is now a new set of panels, right? So it's docking here as like little icons. So we'll deal with that in just a second. And maybe let's do some more here. Let's go back to our window. And I'm going to bring up links. And guess what? That docks that over here as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and minimize this by clicking on this double arrow. And let's see now how we can now customize this. How can we kind of make this our own? So for example, this is just kind of floating here, not really practical for me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag this whole grouping over here, because notice how when I brought in paragraph style, it also brought in character style, which I definitely want. So watch what I do when I drag this up on top, and I'm just gonna move it and look for this little blue halo. See, get a blue halo here, maybe a blue halo here, Maybe when I dock it with these guys here, maybe I can go way to the bottom, look for another one, see, very subtle. See, there's that blue halo there. I'm just gonna go to that first set I saw with the square and drop it, and there it is. Very cool, All right? Next thing I'm gonna do is bring pages 
over here to the left. Just drag that over. Cool, right? Super easy to do, no problem, right? So let's just say, for example, I want to bring my links over there next to properties. I can very easily do that. Drop it in there, wait for my blue halo. Great, nice. Bring that back to layers, okay? Bring layers back over to here. Okay? And you'll practice this, right? You'll see how easy this is to do and really how vital it is as well. All right, I'm gonna come back here to pages. And then with pages, I want this to be all by itself. So what I'm going to do is drag the pages tab way to the bottom, watch this. See that blue halo, let go. And now see that I've now created a whole new segmentation for my workspace. Love that, that's great. This is how I'm gonna do things. Now you'll also notice how I can resize if I want to. Great, don't have a lot of layers here. So I can go ahead and make this nice and big. So there, therefore I can see all my pages, okay? So customize this however you want to for this exercise and for this class, we'll be doing it a particular way. But of course, be comfortable with whatever you need. Okay, now I'm gonna go over here to window and I'm gonna bring in the control panel. So let's go ahead and click on that and you'll see something new now appears here. This is incredibly, incredibly important, making sure to have this open at all times, okay? So again, go over here to window and then bring up the control panel. The control panel and the properties panel, they actually do overlap a little bit. So just keep in mind, you can use both of these. I'll be using both of these throughout this class, but just know that there's some overlap and they both have some really nice utility. Okay, now I love what I've done here and I have outgrown essentials, right? So thank you very much for giving me a foundation. So what I'm gonna do next is just save my workspace as my own. So I'm going to click on this little drop down. I'm gonna skip all these, thanks but no thanks. I'm gonna say new workspace and just give it a name. Okay, I'm just gonna call this Dave's faves, okay? And then notice here, what am I capturing? Panel location, menu customization, wonderful. I click okay, and great, there it is. Now it says Dave's faves up there. Now let's see this in action, right? So I bring my layers panel over here, right? I accidentally close out my pages, right? I'm just making a mess of things, right? Everything is just, man, I'm a mad scientist at work. What do I do? Okay, I can certainly go back to window and bring some of these things back, but what I'm gonna do is just reset Dave's faves. I like to call this the Mary Poppins effect, right? Where it's like Mary Poppins is like, put all away, put your toys away, place for everything and everything in its place, right? She wiggles her broom or whatever she does, and then bam, everything's back in its place. So watch this. I click on Dave's faves, and then I'm going to reset Dave's faves. And watch this. Everything goes right back to where it was. Place for everything, everything in its place. All right, so this is essentially where we're gonna be starting off, and then we'll be giving you a tour and then some um, for the next exercise, all right? And you're gonna be getting more and more of a tour as we go throughout. What I want you to do right now is just pause the video and then practice doing what we've, doing, what we've done here, right? Where I want you to actually create your own workspace similar to mine, but really get an understanding and a feeling of how you can manipulate all these different panels, right? You can move them around, you can minimize them, you can do all the different things that you want, right? And then go ahead and save it as your own. All right, so enjoy and we'll see you in just a bit. Now that we have a good idea of how we can work with the interface and the workspaces, let's go a little bit deeper into some other components so we really understand kind of what's what and where things are and all that good stuff here. So let's just start off just by going way to the bottom here where we can see a few little elements down here. All right, so the first thing we're gonna look at here is our zoom levels. Okay, so how far are we zoomed in on the page? Okay, cool, that's helpful. All right, maybe sometimes you wanna zoom to be able to see something, zoom out to be able to see everything. Other thing we have here is going to be our page number. What page are we currently on? Okay, great, you can go ahead and navigate throughout the page going backwards and forward. You can also go all the way back to the beginning if you want to, et cetera. So let's just go ahead and see this in action. I can click on this and I can go bam, 100%. And then I can go over to here to 25%. Great. Now I'm gonna show you some good shortcut keys for all these things in just a little bit. Okay, but now let's go ahead and see how we can go from page to page 
you can see, bam, I can go to page 18. I go to page 35. Okay, just like that. All right, so great. Whatever works for you. Now, eventually you might start working with the pages panel to be able to do that. But this is just an understanding how you can go directly to a page, especially when you have these big documents like that. Now, of course, you can use these little arrows here, go backwards, forwards, and you click on this first one that takes you all the way to the beginning. Click on the last one that takes you all the way to the end. And we go right back to the beginning. Look at that. I just went up, you know, how many millions of pages there? Great. No problem. Now, the next thing I want you to focus on is this thing. This is very, very important because you're going to want to be looking at this thing at all times to kind of take a look like, uh-oh, what's going on? It's basically telling you, okay, how many errors might you have here, okay? And if you double click on it, what it does is it opens you up to this thing called the pre-flight panel. And it's going to tell you what, in fact, these errors are. It's telling me that I have 57 link errors, okay? There are missing links on all these. Uh oh that's no good. So as you're going throughout the program, as you're creating things, you want to make sure you have no errors and we're going to be able to explore how we can rectify these or simply just ignore them if it's not an issue for you. Okay. But always keep an eye on these. All right. So that's going to be very important. Again, just simply double click on it to then open it up to see, you know, what's going on under the hood essentially. All right. Now InDesign not too long ago introduced the properties panel. So if you click on the properties panel and just drag it out over to here so we can see kind of what's what, you're gonna see currently, because I have nothing selected, I am looking at the properties of my entire document. If I click on an image, I am now looking at the properties of that particular image. Look at that, and I get to do all these things, not only learn about something, but also control it, make some changes to it. Let's go over to here to this text Notice how everything changes, right? Notice I have character and text styles and appearance for that. And I, you can also see I have fonts and all that stuff. So this is going to be really, really helpful for you working with the properties panel to be able to identify what's going on as you're clicking on things to understand what's what. Now, again, I want to make it very clear that when I click on nothing, I get the properties for the entire document. Do you see that there? It says no selection and then document how big this is, my margins, all that stuff. Incredibly valuable to be able to actually make some changes on a kind of a global level that affects the whole document. All right. The other thing you'll see is that if I click on an image, I'll notice that up here where I have my control panel, that also will change. Okay. Let me do that one more time for my type. And you can see I double click on my type to get in there and then notice how it's giving me some familiar options like my font and my font size. And maybe you're familiar with letting and tracking and all that stuff. If not, you will be very soon. All right. So just some things to kind of just interface, you know, as you're going along here. Now, the next thing I want to show you is the ability to kind of take away some of these little lines here. These lines are super helpful to a certain degree, but many times you don't want them at all. So I'm going to give you a nice little shortcut key, which is just simply the W key, right? I'm going to do a capital W. So you have that some important and also you want to do shift plus W. So what do those do? Let's take a look. I'm just going to hit W right now and notice how all my lines go away. I'm going to zoom in, right? And you can zoom in either by doing command control plus plus if you like, or I like to use if I'm using a mouse, the alt or option, and then just scroll with my scroll wheel. So I'm doing that, right? Or you can just do command or control plus and minus. Now I'm going to hit W again, and you can see here, all my lines come back, like my margins and my column separations. Okay. And then my, my text boxes and my boxes around my images, all that stuff. Now, what does shift W do? Shift W takes me to presentation mode and this is awesome. And I'm just using my arrow keys to go through it. Great, this looks amazing. I hit escape and I'm right back out. And then I'm hit the W again, just so I can see all my demarcations so I can be a little more perfectionist about it, seeing all my grids and guides and everything like that. Now, if you're not a keyboard shortcut person, you can see how you can do the same thing with this little guy right here if you want to. So if you click on that, you right click, excuse me, you can see here is preview and then here is presentation mode. So I click on that, does the same thing. I can 
click preview again, and that comes right back to that. Then I'm gonna hit W, get my lines back, come back to here, come back to here. Great, wonderful. All right, so incredibly helpful to be able to preview your document as you wanna be able to see it, not all that stuff here. And then one last thing I'm gonna tell you, and this is <laughs> telling you this because this happens to the best of us. Sometimes you wanna have all your toolbars to kind of go away for a split second. And sometimes it happens by accident. So what is making it do it? Okay, if you just hit the tab key right now, just literally hit the tab key, watch what's gonna happen. Oops, why did it do that, right? Total freak out moment. Hit tab again, and it comes right back, tab, Tab, okay, sometimes that's cool because you're pretty much like getting to see everything, but you don't need all those panels there. Hit tab again and they come right back. All right, so experiment with that, get a feel for it, practice your zooming in, your zooming out, practice working with um, presenting in such a different way, right? Looking at your properties panel, working at your, with your tools, get a feel for the program because it can be a little bit intimidating, a little bit complicated seeming, the more you kind of work with all this stuff in the beginning, it'll really help you kind of not go crazy and really kind of tame the beast that can be in design. But very soon it's going to feel very, very intuitive for you. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we're going to come back in the next video and we're going to start by creating a brand new document and see what all the parameters are around that and have fun. See you in the next lesson. We're now going to create our first original document based on whatever specifications we want. Now, when you open up InDesign, you'll see a whole bunch of choices in terms of what you want to create, how you want to create it, what size, etc. So if we look up on top here, you will see we have a few different tabs. We also have potentially some recent items, and you'll also have some templates that you can work from as well. Pretty darn good templates actually, but let's go ahead and just check out what we have here. So under recent, these are recent things that I've worked on. You can see different sizes. We'll get into what some of these units of measure mean in just a second. Here are gonna be some saved templates that I've worked with, actually some presets that I have saved, right? Maybe it's different pages, different number of columns, all that stuff. And here are some other presets, like if you're gonna be doing print, they have these other preset sizes, and then you can check out the different templates based off of these particular media, right? So you can see here is web. You'll see that the unit of measure is gonna be different, right? Instead of pica, it's gonna be pixels. You go over here to mobile, it's also going to be pixels, but you can also see it's for iPhones, this and this and that, different sizes, view all presets. You'll see different things for iPads, for Androids, etc. All right, so what we're going to do is we're gonna come back to just our first tab, and we're just gonna create something from scratch. Now, when you create a new document in design, you're gonna see a whole bunch of options over here on the right-hand side, some pretty familiar things that really are self-explanatory, but let's go and explain them anyway. <laughs> so let's see here. So what is gonna be the width and the height of your document? Now, first thing I wanna talk about is this whole unit of measure called picas. Okay, technically speaking, a pica is one sixth of an inch. Okay, so, but most of us don't speak in picas, so they do give us the option to then change it to whatever type of unit of measure you want to work with, right? So let's just go ahead and change that to inches, and we'll see that that 66 picas is actually 11 inches, okay? And you can see it switches over here as well. Later on, I'm going to talk about how you can switch this for good to make it so it doesn't stop asking, so it does stop asking you for picas, and you can always have this as the default. All right, so as inches as the default, if that's not clear. All right, so you can also see how you can switch the orientation. Notice how it's gonna go from landscape to portrait. It's also gonna ask you how many pages you want. I'm just gonna say three pages. It's asking me, do I want facing pages? Yes or no. So maybe if you're making a book or a magazine, you might want facing pages. I'm gonna say no. I'm just gonna have maybe like three in a row that are all independent of each other. We're gonna make three independent posters. All right, I'm gonna start on page one. How many columns do I want? You can have more than one column if you want to. Now, before we go any further, I do want you to notice that I do have this option way down below. We come down here where you can actually preview. So if you're not sure on what to do, you can click on this little preview and then behind it, you'll actually get a preview of what we're doing. So as I'm doing this, let's say I'm like, what is a column anyway? So I've changed this to three columns. I'll be able to see that, oh, that's what they're talking about. 
Wait, they're talking about a gutter? What is a gutter? Let's go ahead and increase the gutter. And we'll see there's now more space between those. Let me go ahead and decrease that. And you'll see now there's less space. So depending on what you want to do, I'm going to make mine just one column. It really just depends on the data that you're going to be putting in there, the content and everything like that, how you want to have it structured. Okay. The margins, same thing, right? Change that however you want. Notice is also this little guy right here. It basically means if you change the top, it's going to change also the bottom and the left and the right but maybe you only want to change the left and the right. You can just click on that and then it unlinks these guys. So super easy. See, they're independent of each other. And again, I have the preview so we'll be able to see, okay, how does that look? And you can see there's a difference between the top bottom and now the left and the right. Now we also have our bleeds. Okay. So this is what I have this set up here is a good um, place to be actually uh, for your bleeds. You don't want to make it at zero because essentially what your bleeds are going to be is if you want to have like your images go all the way to the edge, like for example, here, right? You see that how it's going all the way to the edge. That's going to have like no bleed at all. So you want to kind of exaggerate your bleed. If you have it at zero, you might actually have a problem where when it prints, you might still get a little bit of an edge along there. So this is a good kind of rule of thumb to keep it at like 0.125 inches to have your bleed there. All right. And then your slug, we'll talk about that towards the end of the class uh, when we're uh, publishing. But your slug is going to be um, where all your kind of like information about your document is going to go, like your colors, maybe your fonts, some instructions, the name of the document, right, your email, right, that kind of thing. And when you publish it, you'll be able to actually see that kind of on the far outside perimeter of the document. It doesn't actually get printed or cut into the print, but the printer themselves might benefit from that information. All right. So now if I love this, I'm always going to be doing this eight and a half by 11 and three pages and da, 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 all that stuff here. That's great. And I want to save this for the future. I can now click on this guy right here. And that's going to allow me to guess what? Save this as a preset. So when I click on that, I can now save this. I'm going to say three page poster and I'm going to say portrait. Okay, great. Save preset. And that will be in with my saved with all the rest of these. Okay. And just notice how you can also delete it if you want to as well. All right. And then finally, I'm done. So I'm going to come way down here to create and I'm ready to go. Now, just to verify, you will see now I have these three pages. You'll also see in my pages panel, it shows these three pages and you'll see here one, two, three. All right. And when we come back, we're going to explore a little bit about the pages panel, but we're actually going to start creating something, right? We're going to be creating a poster using shapes and some of our other basic tools within InDesign. So go ahead and stop the video, practice this and try to catch up to where I'm at right now so that we can build our poster together. Now, before we get too deep into InDesign and working with all of our texts and our images, etc., I think it's important for us to have a nice little overview of the pages panel because this is where you're going to be spending a good deal of your time in InDesign. So I'm just going to tear this out here and we'll see what I'm looking at here with my pages panel. I have all my individual pages here, right? So I can scroll up and down and I can see all my pages here. Of course, I can scroll up and down going here and just get to them this way. But if I wanted to just simply get to page nine, I can just double click on that and that takes me there. Go back up to page one, just simply double click there. All right. So pretty straightforward. You'll notice I can also work with some other options down below, which is going to be creating new pages and also deleting my pages. All right. So pretty straightforward. If I wanted to just insert a new page, I click on that and a new page gets deleted. I'm going to go ahead and just do control or command Z, get rid of that. Then I can, of course, I can delete and it's going to say, hey, there's an issue here. Don't show again. Click OK or whatever. I'm going to cancel that because I did that by accident but know that you could absolutely do that. Now, right clicking goes a long way in all of InDesign, but in the pages panel, it absolutely does. So if I right click on this, you're going to see here, I can insert pages, move pages. I can duplicate, delete. Okay. Just print this one spread. Okay. You have a lot, a lot of options here. Some of these are a little more advanced, like alternative layouts and our numbering options. We're going to get into those in our advanced class, but just know these options are here. Okay, we're going to get into our panel options in just a minute, but just know that right clicking goes a long way here and your right clicking is actually very similar 
to working with this little panel up there, because when you click on that, you're going to see a lot of the same options, if not the same. All right. Now, you'll also notice in your pages panel is that you may have some other sections up here, and these are known as our masters, right? And towards the end of this class, we're going to get into working with masters. You can see they're very powerful, but you can see I can very easily get to my masters just by simply double clicking it. And now I'm in my master page and you'll see that down below, it shows me that I'm currently in this master. So I can click back here and go right back to page one. Great. And there I am. And then I can go right back to this here. Okay, great. And there I am. All right. So super easy, but very important to understand how to interface with the, with the document now or with the pages panel. Now you'll also note that I can like click all of these little thumbnails independently, or I can also work with them as a spread just the same. So I wanted like, let's just say this page to move over to here. I can easily move the entire page. See that? So really cool. And it groups them all together just as S is actually connected to one of our settings that we have here that groups them together. Yours may not do that. Okay, so that's pretty neat. Or you can also do an entire spread and you can go ahead and move the whole thing up on top wherever you like, right? And then it'll go up and it'll just replace it. So do that. And then again, this is how this is all set up to do it. I'm just going to go ahead and just <clears throat> undo that. All right. Now, another thing you may want to do is work with our panel options. So notice what I did in this case. So I just right clicked in this kind of gray area. I'm going to go over here to my panel options. And this is going to allow me to control how my pages panel is set up. Notice how I have a section here for pages. I have a section here for masters. Okay. And then a few other things related to my icons, which are down below here. Do you want these there or not? Okay. And then also, do you want your masters on top or you want your masters down at the bottom? Totally up to you. But you can see here, if I change this to like extra small, I click OK, they get weeny, weeny, teeny, right? Right click again, go to there. Let's make them jumbo. Click OK. And they get much bigger. See that? Now I have a nice little view of what I'm working on. Depending on your screen size, totally up to you. I'm going to change that back to medium. Great. Masters, you have the same option there if you want to. Great. And then again, do you want these icons to be there or not? Right? Again, up to you. Yes or no. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. And it goes right back to where I was before. Okay, now earlier we introduced you to the properties panel. Now we're going to take a look very quickly at the properties panel having to do with the whole document, if you will, right? You can see here, I have all these options here. It tells me how many pages I have. I can also add on pages if I want to this way. That's great. And then of course I can change all my different margins and all that stuff here, you know, working with all these. And you'll also notice that depending on what page I'm on, I'm going to see the options for that page to be able to edit that particular page. Right now I'm on page two. Now I'm going to be on page six. You can see that. That's great. And now if I click on edit page, it's going to take me to my page editing dialog box here within properties. That's kind of separate from where I was before to then make some changes just to that page. It's kind of cool because let's say, for example, I wanted to change this page just to be landscape. I can do that. See, now this is separate from that particular page. Let's bring that back so you can really see it. See? So if you had like a map or something like that or a chart, you can very easily make that change, right? So I'll just find, let's just go to our first page. Okay, I'm in page one. And now look at that. Wonderful. Now this is landscape, but the rest of these are now in portrait. Okay, so it gives you that kind of control anytime you want just by editing that particular page. All right, and I'll show you one last thing that's going to help you with your kind of page control. And that is this really great tool here. You'll see that right there underneath our selection tool. And this is our page tool of all things. And that might be a better way for you to work with rather than having to kind of dig deep into the properties panel. You can see that you're going to get a lot of the same options here including the ability to go from landscape to portrait just by using this individual tool to be able to do that, All right? So kind of nice. And also you can change the size of the page if you need to and do all those things accordingly. 
All right, so this will definitely be something you want to practice, kind of get familiar with it. Practice on one of your own documents, practice on this document if you want to, the proposal layout template. Well, and just really understand kind of the nuance of the whole panel itself, how the property panels work together with pages, and also finally working with our page tool. All right, so have fun, practice this, pause the video, and we'll see you in the next lesson. So here we are in our new document, all set up with our three pages and our margins and all that good stuff here. So before we even get started actually cracking into things, let's just kind of take a little tour deeper into our interface and some of the tools we're going to be working with. By far, the number one tool you're going to be working with is going to be this little guy right here, right? This nice little selection tool. And if you move your mouse over, it'll tell you this is, in fact, the selection tool. And notice in parentheses, there is a V and an escape. It's giving us two options for shortcut keys, okay? Either V when you are not in the type tool, but when you are in the type tool, you can't hit V, so you just hit escape. So either one will work depending on the context of where you're at. Another one you'll be working with is the type tool. And then notice it's very easy to get to. Just hit the T key. So watch this. If I hit T, that just bops right over to that. If I hit V, that goes over to that, right? So again, T, V, so you can see that pretty cool, pretty easy. I'm not hitting control, not hitting command, anything like that. All right, so super easy to get to those. Another one that we're gonna be working with is gonna be our shape tool, okay? If you right click on it, you'll be able to see I can add on the rectangle, ellipse, polygon, etc. Okay, so pretty nice. Not to be confused with our frame tool. Okay, so notice also different shapes, but our frames are reserved for working with our images. Okay, so as frame does in real life, it basically just contains images. Okay, where this is just going to be working with like color or just a frame, something like that. I'm going to say not a real frame, but a frame that's just going to be more for design purposes. Okay, and then down below here, you will see that there's two options for color. Okay, one is going to be for our fill color, and then one is going to be for our stroke. Okay, the fill is just going to be the inside of the shape, and then this is going to be the outline, if you will. All right, and if you double click on these, you'll see that your color picker comes up. Okay, any one of these. So if I double click on that, you'll see there that is. I want to nice, do this nice little scarlet color. All right, that's great. Cool. Open this up. And I'm going to do maybe a light blue. Okay, great. And you see, if I were to draw something out, it would have that color fill and then that color stroke. All right. So I want to kind of get, get that out of the way just so you see what are going to be some of the basic tools we're going to be working with. The other thing I want you to notice here is that we have our ruler up on top here. Okay. So um, it looks like it did not take when I put in the, the right unit of measure. I'm not sure why. So I'm going to go ahead and change that really easily. You can see it's still in picas. Super easy to change that. So all I'm going to do now is just right click on the ruler. Now, if I right click here and I just choose inches, I want you to notice what happens. It only changes it here on my X axis. It doesn't change it on the Y axis. So let me just go ahead and change that back and show you a nice little trick. If you right click over here in this little nexus, and then I say inches, it's gonna change it for both of them, okay? And the last thing here that we're gonna do before we start cutting into this is just take a look at your layers panel. Hey, your layers panel is gonna be very important for your organization. We're gonna get a little bit deeper into it as we move forward, but I just want you to kind of keep an eye on your layers panel. When you first start, you're just gonna have one layer that's always, going to, that's always going to have other things living inside of that layer before you create an actual new layer. I know that sounds very confusing, because it kind of is, is that if you have like 50 elements on your page and you never create a new layer, all those 50 elements are only going to live inside this layer one. Okay, so we're going to get more organized as we go forward here. So let me just give you kind of an example of what we're going to be working on here, right? And I want you to just see how these are examples of just like some posters that I found that, you know, are just very simple. But what do they use a lot of? They use shapes a lot. So our first lesson is really not just about creating a poster, but using shapes and seeing the value and the power of working with shapes. All right, so you can see here, shape, 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 different colors. You can see circle, circle, circle with a little drop shadow there. And look at that, how shapes are being used for containing our text. That looks really nice. You can see here some other shapes with like little drop shadow, shape, shape, shape. Here's a line that's considered a shape. Here's another shape, more shape. So you can see 
how they're invaluable. You'll see them everywhere, no matter what kind of document you're working with, right? So if we even go back to some of the files that I was working with earlier, I showed you, okay, you can see these shapes are containing our images, okay? But you'll also notice how this is the shape that's behind this other shape. Here's a nice little shape that's underneath there. Let's take a look at some other ones here. Let's take a look. These are just images here, but let me go back to this document. You can see here's a nice little shape, right? And some lines here, okay? So just kind of get an idea that like, yes, absolutely, you can work with shapes in many, many different capacities. All right, so also notice here, I have a lot of documents open here. So if you, in case you wanna close in them at all, you can just go ahead and click on the X, click on the X or simply right click and you can see there's a lot of other options there that you can work with, okay? So let's just start digging into this. Notice here I'm on page one and that's what I wanna be working with. And I'm gonna use as my model, I'm just gonna use this one here because I have three different circles and then three different rectangles. So just see how easy it is to create that but the first thing I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is create a background for it. I'm going to very simply use a rectangle and just draw that into that. Okay. So I'm going to choose the rectangle shape tool and I'm going to say, I do not want to stroke. So how do you do that? Just simply click on the stroke, make sure that's active and then click on that guy right there. All right. So if you look here, it's this little slash and that basically is like, Hey, don't do anything with the active color there with this one. Just gonna double click on that and then maybe bring this up kind of a little bit of a lighter color. And notice how I'm interacting with my color. You can see here, I can change this going this way. I can also change the whole hue in general. And then I can change all of the shading and brightness from here, you know, of said color. All right, so I'm good for that right now. Okay, it doesn't really matter. I can change this very easily. When working with color, you might know your RGB value, right, which is good for, for web-based, right, for the screen. And you also might know your CMYK value, which is good for print, okay? So this is red, green, blue. This is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And then some of you may also be working with your hexadecimal code, all right? And at some point later on, we're gonna talk about swatches and we're gonna see how we can also use this little color picker. But for right now, let's get cracking on this. I'm gonna click okay. I'm just gonna draw out my shape, I'll come all the way down, just like that. Notice how I'm overstepping where the margin is and the bleed and everything. So I just wanna make sure that's in there. It's not gonna print, don't worry. Okay, great. Now I'm gonna right click here. I'm gonna choose my lips tool and I'm just gonna double click there and I'm just gonna find that nice little burgundy color, burnt sienna. <laughs> okay, and then I'm just gonna hold down the shift key to make a perfect circle. Okay, if I don't hold down the shift key, notice I get that, but watch this, hold down the shift key, perfect circle. Great, now I have kind of a container that's ready to go for my stuff and maybe I'm gonna have that a little bit off kilter a bit. Now remember, one of the earlier lessons, I showed you a way to get a preview of it. So if I hit the W key right now, look at that. I'm actually be able to see it without those markings, right, hitting the W key. So I wanna kind of have this a little bit sort of off the page do that okay that's kind of cool maybe it's a little bit too close to the margins okay kind of like that maybe it's a little bit too symmetrical okay fantastic good i'm ready to go all right and i'll bring that back so i can see where my margins are just by hitting the w key okay so pretty straightforward making shapes but now what i'm going to do because i want the same exact shape right literally the same size and everything repeated all throughout so what i'm going to show you next is something that's a great shortcut key, which is gonna be the Alt or Option key. And what does that do? That clones, okay? That is going to clone whatever you have on the screen. So what does that mean? Let's just see that in action. If I hold down the Alt or Option key, notice how my mouse turns into this little double arrow. I'm just gonna go ahead and click and drag, and bam, I've just cloned that. It's like a very quick cut and paste. All right, so I'll go ahead and do that one more time. Great. Now, I don't want these same colors because if we go back to the model that I had here, our sample, right? These are all different colors. So I can just play around with these colors. So I simply select it and I can go back over here to now change my fill color of this. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna simply double click on that and just choose whatever color. Let's make it something a little nicer to look at. 
All right, not too bad. Kind of blends in a little nice with the background. Cool. Click on that, click on that. Okay, so what do I want to change? Again, click on this one here, double click, and then let's have a little bit of contrast. Let's choose green. Cool, hit the W key. All right, starting to come together. I like that. And maybe this is going to be off the page a little bit. Okay, so pretty easy to do, and you're going to see incredibly, incredibly necessary to understand how shapes work. Shapes are going to be everywhere. And just a little bit of background about what shapes are so we kind of can define them properly. Shapes are technically known in both InDesign and uh, Photoshop and especially Illustrator as vector types of graphics, right? Which means that I can resize this as big as I want and you'll notice that it does not get pixelated, right? The edges stay nice and clean and nice and smooth. And that's kind of the benefit of actually drawing out the shape as opposed to like getting a JPEG or a PNG off the internet, drawing it out actually gives you a vector. So when you print it out, you bring it on the web, it's gonna look really nice and neat. So let's go ahead and now I'm gonna draw out my rectangles and I'm gonna make these kind of black. Why not? Okay, come all the way over here to the far left and just notice also the RGB value, all the zeros, right? The hexadecimal zero, seem like a little harder to remember, but you can see, bam, fantastic. All right, I'm gonna click okay. And very simply, just draw out rectangle. Go back to my move tool, right? Very important. I could have also hit the V key to go right back to it. And I'm going to just hold down the Alt key to clone that, hold down the Alt key and clone that. All right, so again, hit the W, okay. It's really coming together. I really like that. Now, earlier I was discussing layers, okay? Notice something very odd, right? We're like, I have six, seven things on here. How come it only says one layer, okay? Now, you, if you didn't understand it the first time, you're gonna get it. Watch what happens now when I click on that little guy right there. You're gonna see, oh my goodness, there's a lot going on here, right? So if I click on this little eyeball, you can see how that rectangle goes away. There's another rectangle going away. Okay, so they're actually here, but they are not named. They're named as rectangle of shapes, and they also kind of live inside this layer called layer one, okay? So if you want to name these, very simply, you can just simply just double click it, right? So I'm just going to double click on that. I'm just going to type out main content. Right? And then you can color code the layer if you want to, and then you can change all these specifications if you want to as well. We're going to get into that a little bit more when we get into more complex content. All right. So really good. All right. So you can see, all right, that might be called, I'll just do one for now. So you can see, I'm going to double click on that. And you'll see when you double click on the sub layer, nothing really pops up. But when you do a slow motion double click, watch that. See, then this gets activated. It's very interesting. Then I'm going to change this to lower left, um, let's just call that text box. Okay, so again, you can go ahead and change these however you want, but we're gonna keep it just for the sake of this exercise, just as it is, just so you can learn the tools, learn the process, etc. Now, coming back to one of our earlier lessons when we were talking about working with properties, Okay, because I want to know the properties of these. I want to be able to manipulate the properties of these. All right, so if your properties panel is not up, you can always go back up to window and you can choose properties and it will pop right up. Okay, very good. Now you'll see for all the things I'm working with, I have all of these individual properties I can now play around with. All right, I recommend you always, always, always have the properties panel somewhat available to you. It doesn't have to be this prominent but just know where it is and just know how to use it. So as an example, if I wanted to change the color of this, notice here is my appearance and my fill. So if I double click on that, this is gonna take me to a number of different, what we call swatches. These are all saved colors that I can now use, all right? Come right back to that. You'll also note that I could go over to any one of these and play around with them, different swatches, gradients we're going to get into, and then my color picker. So let me do that one more time. Very easy to miss. This little guy right here is going to take us to the color picker that we've been working with. On this side, we can also do it with our properties. So I do that one more time, and I go over to here, double click it, 
And let's just say I want to do something a little more kind of bluish gray. I click OK. And there that is. All right. And again, click on this. You'll see my color will change. Click on this. My color will change. All right. Now, let's just take a tiny little tour of our properties panel so we can see all the other options that are hitting, hidden for us. All right. You can see, wow, a lot, a lot of cool stuff that, that we can work with here in terms of our X and Y value, meaning where is it located on the page if you want to be very precise about it our width and height, right? In case they're not the exact same size, you'll be able to see that right there. Okay, again, we looked at our fill. We can change our stroke from here. We also have something known as our opacity, right? So I wanna make this a little more kind of like see-through just for kind of a fun effect. I can make this a little more see-through just by bringing that down a little bit. Maybe we'll bring it down to about 74, 75. And we'll see, oh, okay, cool, a little bit of visual interest. All right, so let's come back to that one more time. Scroll down. And you'll see I have some of my alignment tools here, our text wrapping. We're going to get into all these things later on. Okay, but you can see how there's a ton of functionality in the properties panel as you move through any, any object in InDesign. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. I want you to practice this, catch up to this here, and then we'll do a quick lesson on how to bring in some type and have fun. So I hope you're doing okay with your poster practice and you're all caught up with what I've got here. And we're just gonna do some basic finishing touches on this and that's going to be just doing a little bit of type, how we can bring in type, and also how we can place images. All right, so currently what tool am I in? I am in the selection tool. So I'm just gonna hit the T key and that switches me over to the type tool. Certainly you can go ahead and click on this if you like. And I'm just going to click and drag to now put in what I want to put in. I'm just gonna put in Fanny's flowers, okay? And that's gonna be the name of my shop, so therefore the name of my poster right there. So you can see if you really zoom in, you can really see what I have there, obviously not big enough. So what I'm going to do is simply not double click, but I'm going to triple click on my content in there, and that selects the entire paragraph in this case. And you'll see both in my properties panel as well as in my toolbar up on top for my options, I'll be able to see all my font settings. We're gonna have a much, much deeper dive into text in a little bit, but let's just for right now, just so we can kind of finish our poster, let's make this maybe a little bit bigger. And we'll also learn how we can change the font. So I'm going to make this about, I don't know, 48. That works for me. Then I can change my font. And again, we're going to get into these a little bit deeper. I'm just going to change this to, that's a kind of a fun one. And now very easily, I'm going to resize my text box, bring that down. And I'm going to do two other things. I'm going to make this resized. Notice how I'm doing that. And guess what? I'm going to come over here to my properties panel and I'm going to align that in the center, okay? And then notice I just had to go right to my properties panel to find so many things all associated with whatever I selected. And in this case, it was this text box, all right? So I'm gonna hit W, okay, great. That's coming in, love that. All right, you'll wanna practice that, of course. All right now, we're gonna bring in an image. So in InDesign speak and Photoshop speak and Illustrator speak, bringing something in an image or even text is considered placing. So what we're going to do is we're going to place in another image so we can have that here kind of as the background. So if we go over here to file, you'll see here's an option to place. Also notice the keyboard shortcut, definitely one of the more valuable ones. So I click on place and it's going to take me to this file. I have my links and images. You should have access to these. All right. And then I'm just going to find an image to bring in. Now, when I click on that, you will see this little kind of mouse that's sort of got a little backpack of my image pops up here, essentially giving me the option to now choose where I want to put it and how big I want it. OK, so watch this. I'm going to simply click and drag just like that, just kind of eyeballing it. And then, bam, there it is. Love that. That's pretty great. All right. So easy to do that. All right, so again, if you were to go to File and Place, you just find your image however you want it. We're going to go a little more detail in uh, placing in just a little bit. 
And you'll also notice a few other options here, etc. So in case you get kind of stuck in anything and yours is kind of getting a little bit weird, just make sure that you uncheck this box here. You do not want that checked, okay, just in case. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just cancel that. Now, you'll notice this. It looks good, but not great because guess what? This is all covering all of my text and circles and all that stuff, and that's not what I want. So how do I fix that? How do I make it look how I want it to look? Because ultimately my goal is to make it so this picture is behind all my circles, but in front of all, in front of my, my background color. So if we look over here, we have our image name that's right here and all of our other shapes and our text and everything like that right underneath it. So very simply, all I need to do is just drag this down. So this is gonna be our first kind of major lesson about working with layers. So I drag this down all the way, all the way, right above rectangle, and look at that. Cool. There it is. Love that. That looks better. All right, and I'm going to show you later on how we can work with images more specifically in terms of resizing and all that good stuff. All right, so we're going to do that in the next lesson. But at this point, I want you to get caught up with just doing some basic text and then also placing in images and then playing around with our layers. Okay? So practice that, pause the video, catch up, and we'll see you in the next lesson. In our last lesson, we just learned how to bring in a basic image using the place tool. So we just placed in some images. We also reset, we placed an N image, we resized, no big deal. Let's just bring in some more and we're gonna see how we can do some other things on this document and then also some other documents. So I wanna bring in some images inside of each of these circles. So very simply, I go to File, and Place, or again, Control or Command D. And let me just find this guy here. And I'm just going to click and drag to put that in there. Right? Not going to be perfect for right now. Don't worry about it. Let's find another one. This time, just for fun, I'm just going to do Control D. We'll see how that works. Awesome. Fantastic. Let's find another one. All right, great. And I'm just going to click and drag. All right. And then make sure, by the way, before you actually bring in your next image, make sure, this is very important, that no image is selected here, right? Because if I were to now do a place, it's going to replace this image here, okay? So very important, okay? So kind of get into the good habit of like clicking away, because if I had this selected and I went to place, it's going to replace this one. Sometimes you want that, so it's kind of a nice thing, all right? now. What I'm gonna do next is I'm going to, instead of actually clicking file in place, I'm gonna draw out a frame ahead of time. So my image is going to live inside of that frame. All right, so what do I mean by that, right? These images right here that we just brought in, they actually consist of a frame as well as an image, right? You can see here, there is the frame here, which is gonna be the blue box. And then when I click on the center, that actually becomes this little kind of rusty box right there, okay? So you'll see that there, right? And for some of you, you may actually see a circle in the middle. So I'm gonna activate my circle in just a little bit, okay? So you'll be able to see that just the same way that I'm seeing it and the way that you're seeing it, all right? So that, you'll see that each image has two elements in it. It has both the frame and it has the image inside of it. So what we're gonna do preemptively is just draw out our frame. So if we go over to here, this time what I'm gonna do, just for fun, so you can see what you can do, is I'm gonna draw out an ellipse frame, okay? Meaning I don't want it to come in looking like this. So I'm gonna click on this now, and I'm just going to click and drag while holding down, guess what? The Shift key, and see that? It's now a frame. Just imagine you went to the store, and you picked up a frame from the store, and you're like, okay, now I got my, all my favorite pictures, and I wanna put that inside of the frame. So what I'm gonna do now is just simply go to File and Place, and then I'll find a picture that's gonna go in there. And let's just choose these bellflowers, okay? And it did kind of what I wanted, but not really, right? That wasn't the picture I brought in. We're gonna fix that in just a little bit, okay? But just note that you can bring in a picture inside of a frame. InDesign's gonna do its best to bring it in there for you. All right, so just for fun, I'm gonna do that all over again, just for these, 
just so I actually have circles and not what they want. So you'll be able to see me do that one more time. So I'm gonna do that relatively quickly. Hold down my shift key, gonna do control D. I'll find, this time I'll bring him up there. All right, click away. Remember, get into that good habit. And then again, notice also there is a keyboard shortcut for these. Just go to the F tool, right? And that's gonna access the frame. Hold down the shift key, have there, it's all ready to go. And then also notice the difference between the frame and the shape, it has this X in there, as I said. So now I'm gonna go ahead and just do Commander Control D. Now, before I do this, I do want you to notice a little hint, it is telling me it is going to replace the selected item. So that's what I was telling you before, that you wanna kind of be aware of these things when you do them, because like you wanna make sure that nothing is selected because it's going to replace the selected item. Okay, so very important there. So let's now find another image here, and that's gonna fit in there, kinda not really. Okay, so let's see how we can fix this. Let's see what we can do to do a number of different things. First of all, I wanna have these beautiful flower pictures fit inside there. Huh, not doing it. How do we fix that issue? If you right click on an image that is not fitting in there, you will see that there's this great option here for fitting. InDesign knows that this is something that happens. <laughs> so they have a whole bunch of tools that are gonna allow you to do all these different things. So what's the problem? Do you wanna fill the frame proportionally? Do you wanna fit content proportionally? Is that, that's not really the problem. Do you wanna fit the frame to the content? Hmm, or do I wanna fit the content to the frame? That actually makes more sense, right? Because I'm actually, I want my content, my image, to be the same size as my frame because I drew up my frame first. So watch what happens when I click on that. Nice, that comes in there, but it's not perfect. So I'm gonna right click again, go to fitting. And this time I'm gonna choose this really great option for content aware fit. And let's, it's gonna use its kind of algorithm. And then it kind of fits in there pretty nicely, right? But we can experiment with some other ones. Let's go to fitting and let's just say fit content proportionally. Nah, not so much. So I'm gonna do control Z to undo. And you'll see when I click on this, I now can understand what's going on with this whole frame and image phenomenon. You can see the image actually goes outside of the frame. So if I click and drag right in the center and I get that little rusty color, I can now move this left and right and kind of show what I want to show. Let's do that again for this guy. I'm going to right click. I'm going to go over to here to fitting. I'm going to choose fit content to frame. Not bad. Right click fitting, let's say content to wear fit, but you can also try some other ones, maybe center content, right? Fit content proportionally, just try it all out. I do find that content to wear fit works pretty good for the next step. And you can see pretty good, right? And it also didn't warp the proportions. I click on the center and you can see, bam, there that is. And then this time I'm gonna use the arrow keys in my keyboard to just kind of nudge it. So I don't accidentally click anything else. All right, and let's see what's going on with our groom. So I right click, fitting, fit, uh, I'm going to say fit content to frame. And okay, not bad, but you can see he's a little stretched out. That's not sort of human. So I click on content to wear and there it is, perfect. All right, so you wanna practice this. This definitely, this is gonna be something that you'll see all the time. So number one, what did I do? I just brought in an image without any frame at all. Then what else did I do? I actually drew out my frame and then I had the image go into the frame itself. So depending on what your layout is, you might wanna have it all structured in such a way. All right, now let me show you kind of one of the, the kind of trickiest bits you're gonna see when you're working with images. Because earlier we talked about, we had two different things we're working with here, right? We're working with both the frame and we're working with the content, all right? So the frame is on the outside and the content is on the inside, all right? And they are treated independently. So watch what happens now when I try to resize this image. And this is the kind of thing that makes you go crazy if you haven't worked with InDesign before. I'm gonna try to resize this. I'm gonna make it nice and big. Watch this. Click and drag and, well, that's weird. Let me undo that. Did I do something wrong? Let me try from this side. Click and drag. Huh, what if I make it smaller? Well, something odd is happening. What is actually happening? 
the frame is operating independently from the image. Because I want, when I grab the corners, I want them both to get resized, both the image and also the content. So how do I deal with that? So what I'm going to do is come down here while my image is selected, and I'm going to choose this guy here, Auto Fit. Strange language, but all that is basically saying is, hey, we're going to make both the frame and the content work together, right? Work together as one. So when I do resize, I can now resize both of them together at the same time. Okay, so we'll go ahead and just click on that. Make sure again, auto fit is chosen. Click and drag and bam, there you have it. There you have it, right? Maybe I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger so it kind of takes this up a little bit more. Okay, great. I'm gonna fix that in a little bit because it's kind of still a little bit glaring. We're gonna work with opacity, but really the key thing here is, okay, let's make that just kind of fit in nicely. All right, and we're kind of coming together pretty well with that. Now, you probably noticed as you were doing this that there is a set of options for frame fitting right above auto fit. So of course, it's up to you what you wanna do with that, right? If you wanna right click and go to fitting, or if you wanna say frame fitting, just right from here. Again, totally, totally up to you. Okay, now, one of the last things we're gonna do here with this properties panel, especially for this little image right here, is work with the opacity. Remember how we work with opacity for the shape? We can do the same thing for our image. I want this to be very, very subtle. It's just gonna be just kind of a whisper in the background. So I click on this little drop down here and then drag that over just, it's like barely, barely there, right? It's just kind of like, hey, I'm kind of just like background noise, right? Not a whole lot going on, but I can go ahead and just make that fit. So it goes into the entire frame, see what that does. Oh, that's kind of nice, right? So it's like, your, so, your sort of subconscious sees it more than anything, okay? So it's like, okay, that's just sort of decorative, if you will, all right? So what did we do? We work with frames in many capacity for pictures, right? Then we also went and we fitted the frames after we drew out the frames, brought them in, making sure that the frame is not selected if you wanted to not replace it. And also we worked with doing auto fit to make sure that the frames and the content work concurrently with each other. And then we also worked with transparency, all right? Now, if we take a look at the layers panel, you'll see I now have all of these things all set up, ready to go. I could certainly go and manipulate these however I want to, rename them, reorder them, you know, really practice that, okay? So one last thing here, you'll see that this is selected here and you can see that this is selected and it's just called rectangle, not a very good name for it. So I probably want to change that at some point. But what I'm going to do is just click and drag this over here so I can see that above it. So again, another little review on working with layers. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we'll come back in the next lesson. Now that we've got some of the basics out of the way for our images, let's do some maybe more advanced kind of creative things. So I'm just gonna hit the W key so you can see what I have going on here. This particular image has a nice little stroke around it. So if I click on the image, you'll be able to see in my properties panel, it shows me here that I have a white stroke around this that is two and a half points. So if I were to make this bigger, you'll be able to see that's going to grow. Pretty cool. I can then also make this have also a different style of a stroke. You can see that, let me make that nice and big. Pretty cool, that can be kind of fun kind of creative. So you'll want to play around with all the different types of strokes, the width of the stroke and everything that you can do in terms of the color, the width, right? All the different styles, everything like that. So pretty neat, all right? So play around with that, kind of experiment with what's going to work for you. Now you'll also note that for certain documents, working with text wrapping is going to be very important. Okay, so if I were to go to this image and now move this up here, I want you to notice how my text just kind of gets the heck out of the way, right? It's like, okay, image coming through. So you'll see it could actually be very beneficial when you're working with images and type together to work with text wrapping. Where can I find my text wrapping options? You guessed it, the properties panel. Let me go ahead and make this taller so we can actually see pretty much most of our options available to us here. So. Again, you see here the transform and all those other X and Y, et cetera, all those things there. There's my stroke, et cetera, all right? But now you're gonna see I have 
everything having to do with text wrapping right here. All right. So if I want this to wrap or not wrap, if it's not wrapping properly, then I can work with it better. So let me go ahead and turn it off so you can see what it's going to do kind of by default. So when I say no text wrap, which is right here, you're going to see all my everything gets all messy, right? Like, uh oh, that's a problem. Don't want that. So it's very easy to apply that. You'll see that there's a number of different text wrapping options, wrap around bounding box, wrap around the actual object shape. This will actually just jump it, right? Which actually might be a good candidate for this. And then you'll see this is going to just jump to the next column if you're working in columns to this extent. So for this example, it's either gonna be wrap around the bounding box or this one. Since we already saw this one here, wrap around the bounding box, let's just see what this one does. And look at that, it just jumps it. Okay, that's pretty cool. Just like, all right, because it takes up the whole width, the whole frame, excellent. Now, you will notice that there's a space around the image, right? This kind of padding around it. So you might want to have a little bit of padding around it because if you don't, then guess what? It's going to be way too close and then that's not going to look very clean, not going to look very nice. So you'll see here I have the top padding, the bottom, the left, and the right. And then notice again, here's my link icon to be able to say, hey, do I want all those things doing that? Yes or no. And in this case, it's really just about the top and the bottom. So I'm just going to uncheck that and then just make that go a little bit higher. Notice how it's pushing away my type. Okay, pretty cool. And then let's do it also for the bottom. Let's push that, push that, push that. Okay, nice. A little bit of breathing room. Hit the W key. Cool. Now that's nice and clean. I love that. All right. Okay, now let's go to one more fun feature I want to show you that you can do with images, and that's changing the shape, if you will, right? So looking at this particular image, you will see here that it is a square, right? No big deal. But I might want to change the frame shape of this so it's a circle. So how do I do that? Like, I don't have to start all over again, draw out the circle, and then bring it all in again. Too much work, right? Waste of calories. So what I can do is, again, make sure the image is selected, and go over here to the Objects menu, way up here. And then you will see way down below is this Convert to Shape. And look at all the different shapes that I can convert this to. If I want to do a rounded rectangle, you'll see now that is a rounded rectangle. You see that? Oh, that's pretty neat. That's super easy. Let me now change that to something else. I'm going to click on my image again. Go over to here to Object over here to convert to shape. Now let's try an ellipse. Oh, kind of like that too. Now it's not a perfect circle. Guess what? Now I'm going to see the benefit of working with a, sh a shape of the frame independent of the content itself. So make sure that auto fit is not selected in this case. And now I can just go ahead and bring that in. And you'll see that now I can make this perfectly round. Okay. So a lot of cool things you can do, right? So you can convert these things, again, by going over to Object and Convert Shape to change it to a different shape altogether, okay? And we can also work with text wrapping, right? And then all the other options I showed you before in terms of fitting, bringing them into the content you want, etc. all right? Now, one last thing I'm going to show you in terms of changing the shape, and again, this is going to be maybe a little bit more advanced, but definitely a helpful thing, is being able to actually change what we call the corner radius right here on the fly. All right, so look at this one right here. You'll be able to see how the corner radius, which means the corners right here, is exactly zero, right? That means that it is just a hard corner. If you go over to our appearances over here on the right hand side, you're going to see it says corner and then you'll see it's like that. All right. And you can see it's just a hard corner. So I can easily change this now to a very different one. I'm going to change this to bevel. All right. Very subtle. I'm going to make that go a little bit bigger. I'm just watch that grow, grow, grow. Cool. That was easy. Let's try a different one. Let's go to fancy. That is indeed fancy. Wow. Look at that. Let's try something else. Let's go to inset. And again, you play around with these and that inset. I want that, but maybe it's a little bit too much. So I bring that back up again. Cool. So depending on what your goal is, what you're doing. Now, what I just showed you here, even though this is just an image, I can easily do this on 
shapes just the same. So if we go back to here and if I wanted to make this into something, whatever, fancy, inset, right? Any of these other things, I can absolutely, absolutely do that. So now it's gonna look more like a, you know, a badge of some kind, right? So let's go ahead and do the same thing for all of these. It's not the one I did. What was it again? It was that. And finally, that. All right, and then that starts to look maybe a little more important, really stands out, a little bit of visual interest, okay? So just because you have a shape doesn't mean you can't change the shape. Just because you have an image with a frame around it doesn't mean you can't change it, right? You can change the size, you can put a stroke around things, you can change the corner radius of it, you can change the stroke color, the stroke uh, style, so much you can do, all right? so. If you haven't paused the video at this point to practice all of these things around images, I strongly, strongly encourage you to do it. Okay, watch the video again if you need some review, but this is gonna give you a great foundation for images, the importance of images, and give you really the skills and the comfort level you need to really master everything you need to do when you're bringing in images and how it works with text, with text wrapping as well. All right, so go ahead and pause the video, have fun, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now that we're a little more comfortable with placing in images, working with images, manipulating them to a certain degree, let me show you a quick little pro tip for bringing in images in bulk, but also for aligning them, putting them into a little bit of a grid system. This is gonna be good if you're maybe creating a contact sheet or a catalog, you know, any time where you're going to have like a lot of images all at once. So how do we do that? Let's go ahead and just click on file, click on place, right? Same deal. And all I'm going to do now is just click, 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 just adding on. I got four, five, and six pictures ready to go. I'm not going to choose show import options, click open. And now just wait for it. I'm just going to click and drag. And now with my arrow keys on my keyboard, I'm just going to hit the up arrow. Then I'm gonna hit the right arrow, right arrow. See that? And I can also resize it just like that. So the up and down arrows will create rows. The left and right arrows will create columns for you. So that is perfect. I let go of my mouse and just like that, perfect setup, amazing. And I can go ahead and grab them all just like that. And I'm good to go. Really, really awesome, okay? So you wanna practice that. But now, before I let you go and practice that, let's talk about another way you might actually want to do something similar to this, and that's working with frames, okay? So you actually may want to work with frames that are pre-existing that are essentially placeholders for you. So you can do the same thing when you're drawing out a frame. So let's just say I wanted to bring in you know, six individual frames that are gonna be placeholders waiting for me to bring in my images, right? I don't have those images yet, but I know they're going to live there. So as I click and drag now, I'm gonna do the same thing, right? See, perfect. But in this case, it's gonna be nine images, okay? Because I have three rows and three columns, and now you can see, bam, those are ready to go, and then maybe I wanna place them right here. All right, so these are just gonna be my frames all set as placeholders, ready to go, where I can now bring in an image if I want to very simply and easily. So let's just go ahead and bring her in there. And then again, we learned about this, right-clicking, fitting. I'm going to fit the content of the frame. And then that's a little bit of review for you. Okay, and then content to where fit. And perfect, she fits in there nicely. All right, so now, but again, I have it all set up. Maybe it's for me, maybe it's for my coworker, I'm collaborating, maybe I'm with a client whatever it is, okay? So either preemptively, you're gonna bring in your images or you're going to set up frames to be able to have placeholders all ready to go, all right? Pause the video, practice this. This is one of my favorite, favorite things and have fun, we'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, and welcome back. Hopefully you are enjoying your exercises and you're ready for some more fun stuff to learn. Uh, we're gonna continue on with this discussion on images However, this is not just about images, what we're going to discuss here, because we're going to discuss alignment. And the alignment really falls into the category of aligning really anything you see on the page, any kind of object, where it could be 
text boxes. It could be shapes, could be images, could also be alignment within a text box, right? So I want this center aligned. And we saw earlier that we can actually align these, right? Really nice and easy. And you'll also see that I could align objects that are all right next to each other, to each other, but I can also align them to the actual margins of the page if I want to. So let's just say, for example, I want to align this little badge with this badge. Okay, cool. How would I go about doing that? As soon as I click on both of these, and I just held down the shift key, by the way, to do that, you will see that the properties panel now shows me all of these alignment options over here. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and check these out and see what's happening here. Notice I can left align them, I can center align them, right align them, top, and then also centers in the vertical, and then also looking at the alignment on the bottom edges. So you can do a lot of things here. But now, before you even just kind of go pull the trigger, I want you to notice this little guy right here. This is very, very important. This little guy right here is saying, okay, what am I aligning it to? Because sometimes when things don't go right, it's usually because this guy is not really doing it what not really doing what we want it to do okay it's doing what we probably told it to do but we didn't realize what in fact it is telling us to do so if you click on the drop down you're going to see i have a line to selection a line to key object a line to margins a line to page a line to spread currently it's saying oh a line to margins that's not what i want i want to align to the selection so therefore these guys are now talking to each other right do you see that so if i say a line left see that now they're perfectly aligned, okay? As a result of me choosing align to selection, okay? So we gotta wanna pay attention to these things here, okay? So just be aware of kind of what's what, all right? Let's add on another element to this. Let's say I want these to all be kind of like perfectly distributed among them. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose the first one, hold on the shift key, second, and now the third. And you'll see that underneath the line is all of my distribute object options. <laughs> okay, so let's just see what these guys do and how this can actually help us. I want these to be evenly distributed among each other. Okay, so all three of them are selected. And let's just see what happens when I click on that distribute top edges. Oh, that's pretty neat. Oh, nothing different there when I do distribute my vertical centers, right? Because they're all equally distant in terms of Sorry, they're all actually the same size. So there's not gonna be any difference between the top and the center and the bottom. All right, so you can see what's happening with each of these. If I choose this one, I'm gonna be getting something a little bit different, right? Because it's distributing something a little bit different, not necessarily what I wanted to, right? You can see this is gonna be more or less the thing that I want. All right, so notice how they are perfectly distributed among each other now. So I click away, let me put my W on there. And that looks pretty nice, okay? Because these are aligned with each other and then all three of them are evenly distributed away from each other, okay? And that's as a result of working with distribution, okay? So pretty nice. I want you to really just practice that and understand kind of how these work. You can use some of your other images as well. Okay, now some of you may want to go a little more advanced. We're not going to do that so much in this class, but I want you to know that there are other distribute options in terms of distribute based off of a certain type of spacing and a certain amount of spacing. If you always want it to be a certain amount away from each other, you can absolutely do that. Okay, so go and experiment with those on your own. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, let you practice that, and we're going to come right back on this particular document, right exactly where we are, and we're going to talk about links. Just a brief discussion on links. We'll see how important they are, how valuable they are, and how easy it is to work with. Now, as promised, we're going to talk about links. So you may have seen links referred to when you open up a document and it says, hey, we need to update our links or we can't find certain links. Links, for the most part, are going to be talking about images. All right, because you're going to be linking up images that you're going to be placing into your document rather than having them embedded into the document itself. Because many times, especially when you're printing, you're going to be working with very, very large images. And in order for InDesign to not be you know, bogged down by really heavy images, it just links it up. 
All right, so this is gonna be pretty important because you wanna make sure that you can find these links when it comes time to send it to your printer and everything is nice and tidy. And also you wanna make sure that, that the links themselves don't get compromised. All right, and you're gonna see an example of when we're gonna have lots of compromising, we might have some problems otherwise. So where do our links panel, where does our links panel live? It's gonna live right here. You can see here as links for me. If you don't find it, you can always just simply click on window and go over here to links and it's gonna pop right up. I'm just gonna pull this over here and you will see very simply, I have just these four images here, right? One, two, three, and then the image in the background. So nice and easy, I can see, great, I have this image and guess what, it's on page one because I only have one page, right? It makes sense, you can see, bam, there they are. Great, wonderful. You'll also see that on the bottom, gives me all this information about that particular image. What is the color space? You can see the size of it, the PPI, the location of it, the date that it was modified and created, you know, all that good stuff there. Fantastic, when it was placed, love it. All right, so that's pretty important. Now, this one's pretty straightforward and this one's actually nice and intact because you'll see weight on the bottom, I have no errors. That is your goal. That's what you wanna see. Because if you have any things that are not linked, like let's say my coworker deleted this image, my coworker moved it to another folder, right? Changed the name, something like that. This will then change to one error. Okay, or two or three or four, whatever it is. Okay, so we want to kind of pay attention to that. So let's look at an example from another document, this long doc class, you'll see, I have a lot of errors in this. How do I know that come down to the bottom here, and you will see, there it is 57 errors, boo, we do not want 57 errors. So I'm going to go ahead and just double click on that. And you will see that I have 56, 56 link errors, missing links. Oh my goodness. And it tells me what page they're at and everything like that. Oh my God. Wow. So what do I do? Let's at least just see what they are. Like, oh man. Okay. There's something missing on that side. Okay. Let me just see if I can. Okay. Maybe it's just this little flower. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Some of these are AI files, illustrator. Some of them are JPEGs. You can bring in Photoshop files if you want to. Okay. Let's just go over here to this one. Okay, wow, all right, that's, that's an issue. I need to resolve this. Why do I need to resolve this? Towards the end of the class, we're gonna discuss packaging our files, all right? Notice this is a pre-flight panel. So before you package, you need to look at your pre-flight to make sure that everything is airtight because what's going to happen is that when I package it, it's gonna be looking for all these images to package together to send to my printer so my printer can do a good job of printing the highest, best quality possible. So it needs all those images when I finally do package them. All right, we're gonna be doing that towards the end of our lesson, but I want you to really understand how important this is. All right, I'm gonna close this out and let's see what we need to do to resolve this issue. Okay, so I have a lot, a lot of issues here, right? Lots of problems. So if I go to here, you'll see again, all my information, okay, blah, blah, blah. But then you're gonna see these guys right here. They're gonna help me with my problems, okay? So let me just make this a little bit taller so I can see it there. We can see how this can interface, do that. All right, and then let's just see what we can do to resolve some of these issues here. So if you move your mouse over here, you can say relink from CC libraries. I'm not working with my Creative Cloud libraries, but that might be something you wanna do. You can see here is also relink, just relink period. Okay, and you'll see also I can just go to that link where this lives presumably. Is that there? I'm not exactly sure, but I'm just gonna go ahead and just relink this. Okay, so let's just see what happens now when I click on that. And I'll be able to see, there's the image I'm looking for, isn't it? Oh, okay. So I can click on this and then maybe it's gonna relink it, that's great. But I also want you to notice this very, very important checkbox that is gonna help you just immeasurably search for missing links in this folder. Yeah, because you know what? A lot of his buddies are probably in the similar folder or at least like one or two of them, who knows? So I'm gonna click on this now, all right? You're gonna see, all right, it's linking it up. I'm gonna click okay, one by one. It's looking for it, it's looking for it. Wait for it, 
okay, searched this relinked directory and found and relinked what 56 missing links. I love that. Thank you. InDesign, I click OK, and guess what? No more crazy icons to scare the behooges out of me. That's amazing. And guess what? I only have one error, and that error has nothing to do with links anymore, does it? It's just text, text overset, and you'll see what that means in a future or past lesson, depending on where you're at with things. <laughs> okay, but no worries. Now I'm all set with links. All right, so you want to practice that. You will see that. That will be coming up many, many times as you're working with, with images and when things get moved around. So you want to be able to kind of know where they are, be able to find them, and also learn about your images as well. All right, so that's just kind of the, the long and short of working with links. And again, understand why we did that. When you're finally going to package your final document as a PDF or getting it printed and et cetera, et cetera, you want to make sure that everything is nice and airtight there. All right, so practice that, pause the video, right? You can work with the document that you have here um, available because there should be some missing links there for you. And then make sure you got the process down and watch this as much as you need to. All right, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Let's now get a little bit more advanced, complex, and creative on our images. So one thing you may want to do is copy the style and effects that you have for one particular object and apply it to another. So, so far you've probably seen that I have this little badge here that has this particular color, and I do not have that same color here. So let's say I wanna just copy this and say, hey, listen, can I borrow that from you? No problem. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select the object that does not have all of the object properties that we want, and very simply, we're gonna go over to this little guy right here, this little eyedropper, right? Think about what eyedroppers do. They just suck things up so we can borrow it from another place and then apply it. So very simply, I'm gonna click on my eyedropper, click on this, and just like that, it's done. That's amazing. How cool is that? Okay, let's now do it for this one. Go to there and bam, there we are. Okay, so that's all set up. Now, I do wanna talk about something called styles that we're going to be working with in a future set of lessons. And styles are gonna allow us to save the look and feel of these in terms of the color and maybe the corner radius and the transparency and all that good stuff. So that way we can reuse it over and over again. Okay, so in the future, we're gonna be talking about lots of different types of styles. That's going to be an object style. It's going to apply to different objects, right? Like text boxes and shapes and images. All right, now let's go ahead and go on to something else that you might wanna do creatively. And that's working with our different effects. Okay, so where are our effects? So I click on my image here and you will see that there is, where are you? Right over here is effects. And you literally see it says FX. And you'll also notice that there is another place to see effects and that's going to be here just the same. So what are our effects? When I click on that, you'll see, I can put a drop shadow in there, an outer glow, inner glow, a feather, right? So it's kind of has a nice little soft glow around it, all kinds of different things we can do. I'm just gonna put on a very simple drop shadow for this, click on drop shadow. And you'll notice, if you zoom in here a little bit, you'll see I got a nice little drop shadow there. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click okay. I click away. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Hit my W. All right, to see how that adds on a little bit of dimensionality to my image. Now let me turn that back on. And let's just try it for this one, but maybe I want to just control it a little bit more, see what we can do. Go over here to effects, say drop shadow. And now you will see I can now really customize what my drop shadow is going to be. Let me just bring this over a little bit more over here so I can see it. And now what I'm going to do is just customize what my drop shadow properties are going to be. Now you will notice that I have all of all those effects that I've saw earlier and all the things that I could now add to it if I want to. We're just gonna work with our drop shadow and all of its properties right here. So you can see everything that I have available to me, including my position and distance, my opacity, where it's offset, okay, the angle of my drop shadow, Right, all kinds of different things. So let's just go ahead and explore what we can work with here. 
So if I go to my distance, let's just go ahead and bump that up a little bit and just see, notice how that goes away and it comes right back. Notice as I do that, my offset for my X and my offset for my Y also change. So X is going left and right, Y is going up and down. I can also change the angle. So I can click and drag on this little sundial thing here and you'll notice how that changes. Essentially, this is saying, well, where is the sun coming from to cast the shadow on this side, right? So it might be kind of counterintuitive, but you understand exactly what the sundial is in fact doing. Let's now increase the size. And what that does, not to be confused with our offset and the distance, basically it makes it kind of look a little more diffuse, if you will, right? You can see that it's a little more subtle, okay? And then we can play around with the spread a little bit. And that's going to go way out just like that. You really have all the control in the world how you want to work with this. And then you have your opacity and also you have your color up on top here. So if I bring my opacity all the way up, you'll notice what that does, right? A little bit darker, a little bit lighter. And if you want a little more creative, you can change the color of your drop shadow and you can see, oh, that's kind of nice. I can maybe match it to be my flowers or whatever it is. I'm gonna keep it a black, click okay. All right, and then I'm good to go, right? Of course, certainly play around with all these as much as possible. I'll click OK. Love that. That looks great. Let's maybe do another effect. This time I'll go up to here. And then let's just do an outer glow. Now, let's see what our options here are for our outer glow. Notice how it's a little different than it was when I worked with my drop shadow. And you'll see that there is a different mode, right, that we have not explored yet, right? It's a little more advanced, but this is a blending mode. Right, which is known as screen. And then that is my color of what the actual outer glow is going to be. If you click on this, you'll see there's a number of different blending modes. Essentially, it's gonna be a little bit darker with its background, right? That's what the blend mode has to do with, right? And a few other things that you'll just really want to experiment with. That's gonna be reserved for a little more advanced class, but it really is a very kind of spice to taste type of approach. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change this color I'll just change that to maybe not yellow because it's got a green background. And I'm gonna change this from screen to normal. You'll notice how it jumped up a little bit. And then let's bring up the size somewhat. Go out, out, out. Now I can really, really see it. That's great. Maybe I'll bring up the opacity so I can really, really see it. And you play around, okay, great. I love that, that's fantastic. Again, play around with all the things, right? Very similar to what we saw before with our drop shadows. I'm like, okay, good. You know, just really sort of spice the taste. What do you like? What don't you like? And then say, okay. And then there we are. Fantastic. Now, earlier we talked about object styles. And if you recall, object styles are basically going to be a saved format. So if I like this format, I can save this as a style. All right, so plant that in the back of your head for something that we're gonna be spending a lot of time on for styles to be able to save it so we can apply it over and over and over again, but then really be able to make very quick and easy changes on a more universal level. That is gonna be object styles, and we're gonna be doing that very soon, so stay tuned for that. So what I'd like you to do for right now is practice using the eyedropper tool, practice applying different FX styles, right, to your different objects. Play around with some of even the ones that we did not work with just to kind of see how easy it is to apply it and get ready for the next lesson that we're going to do on object styles. This lesson is going to focus on object styles, object styles. So let's first define what a style is. Essentially, a style is going to be a format that is going to be saved that we can apply over and over again. So the format could be, hey, I love this drop shadow and I wanna have this object inherit that drop shadow. I might wanna put um, an image that's going to have this little stroke around it. Okay, fantastic. And I also want this one to also have the stroke. Maybe I want this image to have rounded corners and I want all my images to have rounded corners, but I don't wanna to have to do them over and over and over again. That is when object styles come to the rescue and help you implement these things and execute things in a much more expeditious way. And if you decide you want to change things, you can also change it in a very fast and efficient way. So 
first thing we want to do before we do anything at all is bring up our object styles panel. Where are we going to find that? All of our panels live where? Inside of our window menu. Click on that and you're going to see that there is a whole section just for styles. We come over to here and I'm just going to bring up my object styles. All right, and then just for right now, I'm just going to dock this over here, keep things nice and neat. And you'll see I have these kind of like generic ones that don't really have too much to do with anything at all, right? Like none, basic graphics frame, basic text frame. Okay, and I want to click on this guy here. Okay, notice this says has none, right? Click on that. None, right? There's nothing really going on there. Even though I actually see the effect here, the style has not been saved. Okay, so my goal at this point is to use this set of effects that I have in this object and apply them to all of my other objects that are on here. And then keeping it again, all saved and universally applied. Because that way, if I decide, listen, I'm going to do a completely different thing, I want to actually make it a universal change. So how do I actually make this into a style? First thing you typically want to do is apply your effect or whatever you're going to do to your object on what I like to call the front end here, like on this, you know, just like how we did it in the last lesson. And then you will see over on the lower right of my object styles panel, this little plus sign. And before you click on the plus sign, I want you to find the alt or option key on your keyboard, which is going to allow the dialog box to pop up when you click on this great new style. I click on that and fantastic, wonderful. All right. Now, everything that you're seeing here relates to what I clicked on here. So essentially, it's like picking up on what I've selected as its own style. So if we go over to here on the right hand side, you're going to see that there is this fill effects option here. And I click on the bottom the drop down for the drop down for drop shadow. And you'll see that there are some elements here based off of what I have selected on this object, right? And that's actually what I applied early on. So, okay, cool. This is what my style settings are. On the left hand side, this is where I can actually make some changes to that if I wanted to. If I wanted to upgrade this, I can absolutely, absolutely do that. I'm not going to do that now, but these are going to be your options to be able to do that. And we're going to come back to this in a little bit. Let's just keep it nice and simple. So I'm just going to minimize this, minimize this. This is great. I love this. So all I'm going to do now is just very simply name this. All right, I'm just going to call this drop shadow object, whatever you want to call it, right? Totally up to you. And I always like to have the preview checkbox chosen. And as well, I like to have the apply style to selection. This part surprisingly is very, very important because you want the object that you've chosen to also have the style applied to it. It may have had the effect applied to it, but it doesn't have the style name applied to it. Okay, so both of these should be checked. All right, fantastic. Good to go. I click OK. All right, and now I have a new style here. Great. Now I want this to also have the same style. So when I click on this, you'll notice also none. But when I click on this, look at that. It looks exactly the same. Click on this. Wow, amazing. Super easy. Okay. Now let's see it in action. Let's say I want to do a different type of drop shadow. I want to change the direction of it, something like that. Let's now see it in action. I'm going to edit this object style by simply double clicking on it. And it opens right back up to that same dialog box I was in. And you will see on the left hand side, as I showed you earlier, this is the part where I can actually make the changes. So when I click on drop shadow here, this is going to look very familiar to when we actually created my drop shadow and all the parameters around that. So I want you to watch as I change, for example, the drop shadow angle. So watch this as I click and drag going this way. Notice how all three of them changed. They're all connected. Okay, let's go ahead and just increase the spread a little bit. Look at that. All three of them have that. That's so cool, right? Because I'm working with what? A style. All right, let's make the spread go out a little more. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. I click OK. And see, now they're all universally affected because I'm working with a style. All right, styles are going to be invaluable for you. All right, now let's go over here to our trifold here. And just for fun, let's play around a little bit more with this particular one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my properties panel up here. 
And again, I'm on the front end of things. I'm going to make some changes to this. Let's now put on a rounded corner and I'm going to make that even more rounded. All right. And I love that. Good to go. So I'm going to make this into an object style. So making sure that my object style panel is up with this selected, I'm going to hold on the alter option key to now create my new style based off of the selection. And now I'm just going to say rounded corner image and then white stroke, All right? So whatever it's got on there, that's great. And you can come in here to verify if you want to. You might have to go a little bit deep to see kind of what options right, you have here, like your stroke. Right? You can see that there is going to be a stroke weight of 2.5, right? And the color is paper. Okay, that's great. You can go even further over here to our corner options. You can dig deep. You'll see that it is in fact there, all right? But I don't need to. I trust in design. I click OK. And now we'll see my object style panel. That there's going to be a little more in this particular one. Here's the one that I just created. And now I want this object to inherit what this is on here, right? So I click on that and I'm like, oh man, this is so different. It's like my boss comes over and says, well, we needed to look exactly like this. This one looks beautiful. Ah, oh, man. Okay. What did I do? I can't even remember how I did that. Oh, you know what? Thank gosh, golly. What did I do? I saved this as a object style. So I click on that and then what the, oh my God, that's perfect. It did exactly what this one is doing. All right. And guess what? I can always go back and make changes to this just by simply double clicking on it. And then I would go over to all the settings on the left hand side to say, hey, listen, the stroke is now going to be a little bit thicker and just make that thicker. And then guess what? Both of them now change. So just imagine if you had like 50 of these things, because you're working with an object style, you'll be able to actually make just one change instead of the objects inside of the object style panel and you're good to go. All right, I'm going to click OK. All right. And then let's talk a little bit about how what other things are known as objects. All right. So if I go to, for example, this right here, this is actually a text box. Right. We know that, right? We've seen text boxes. We're going to get even deeper with text boxes in some subsequent lessons. But this is also known as an object, believe it or not. So if I had something I wanted to do with this, then I would actually make this as an object style so I can repeat that over and over and over again. All right. So I want you to kind of put a pin in that as we get a little bit deeper with our text box objects. And if you need to actually save it and repeat it for other ones, make it into an object style. All right, so there's lots and lots of different other objects like shapes, text boxes, images, etc. And just remember, object styles are gonna help you be more efficient to save your formats and then also execute them likewise for additional objects. All right, so go ahead and pause the video practice what we've just done, make sure you understand the concept of object styles and also the process around that. Because guess what? In a little bit, we're going to be doing different kind of styles as well, not just object styles, but paragraph styles and also cell styles. All right. So pause the video, practice, have fun, and we will see you in the next lesson. Now we've talked quite a bit about images, then objects and effects on objects, effects on images, and even object styles. Next, we're gonna talk about type, topography, text and fonts, and all that good stuff, because InDesign, if nothing else, is definitely gonna involve you creating documents that have text in there. So we wanna be able to have as much control as possible over our type, not just some of the basic things like font and font size, but we're going to be working with things like letting, kerning, tracking, maybe some baseline options or alignment, all that good stuff here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to work off of this HP long doc document, and I'm just going to work with this text. So it's really nice and easy to get into text boxes. If you have a text box already, even though I'm working with my selection tool, I can very easily double click inside of a text box 
to get into the text box. Even though I'm not in the type tool, it automatically takes me to the type tool. All right, so very cool. Now, if I do a triple click, excuse me, let's start with a double click. If I do a double click, I select the word. If I do a triple click, it selects the line. If I do a quadruple click, it selects the paragraph. If you do five clicks, it actually will select the whole text box in this case. And this was a whole thread of text boxes. All right, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about how text boxes all work together. All right, so again, double, triple, quadruple, quintuple. <laughs> okay, so you can see how nice some of these shortcuts are. All right, so let me just go ahead and just do just this paragraph for right now so you can see how things work. Now, a couple of ways to be able to manipulate my type and the paragraph and all that good stuff here. Number one, you guessed it is the properties panel, right? We've been working with this already. And number two is going to be this section up here. But one thing I want you to notice is that the section is actually broken out into two sections, okay? One is gonna be for character, one is gonna be for paragraph. So what's kind of interesting is that I got one section here and another section here. All right, so totally up to you how you wanna work. If you wanna work with the properties panel, you can do that. Or if you wanna work with our control panel up on top, again, totally up to you. There's some overlap on all of these. All right, so for right now, I'll just start off with my little top control panel and see what our options are. So right now, it tells me here that I'm working with this particular font style, right? This Montserrat OTF. Okay, great. And I can very easily change this to something else that gives me a nice little preview of it. Okay, pretty cool. Now, you will see that when I'm choosing these, I also get a little preview of it. In addition to being able to then decide, listen, I like this font a lot. I would like to save this font. So how do I save a font? If I like a font, I wanna save this just to kind of like, hey, listen, this is gonna be something I wanna work with over and over again. So if I find like, let's just say, articulate right here, articulate extra bold. Okay, that's great. Notice how on the right-hand side, there's a little star, okay? I can now click on that. This is actually already my favorite, so I'll choose another one. Let's try Baloo. I click on that, and now it's gonna say add to favorites. Great, let's try another one. Let's try this. Bodoni, add to my favorites. Okay, cool. So those are gonna be easy to find, but how do I find them? What do I do? You will see that up on top here, let me go back to this, up on top here is going to be this little star next to this little filter icon. So essentially what this is saying, hey, do you wanna only show just your favorites? So when I click on that, guess what? Only my favorites now show. I wanna remove something, let me go ahead and remove Baloo. It's no longer part of my favorites. Let's remove that one, okay, great, I like this one, I don't need that one. Okay, great, click back on that, it takes me right back to all of my fonts, click back on it, it shows me only all of my favorites. So it's a really nice way to stay organized with things. You can also filter by other things, the different classifications, sans serif, serif, script, you know, and a few other things here, like more gothic type of things. And you'll see here, it'll just allow you to only show those particular types of classifications of fonts. So you just want to experiment with it. Also shows you your history. Okay, so really cool stuff here. So I'm just going to keep this for right now, right? And then this is just set as my, let me just go ahead and quadruple click there. And then I'm going to choose this articulate extra bold. That's great. Love that. And then I go over to here. There might be some other different parameters that you can save the font as or apply the font as, regular italic. Each font might be a little bit different. Like Arial, it's got like five or six different ones. You know, Helvetica, it's gonna be the same thing. And of course, here is the option to increase the font size, decrease it. All right, so these should be pretty basic for you. Now, you may see some things that you have not heard before in terms of the terminology, right? What things are called. So let's explore things a little bit deeper. And that's gonna be number one, this is my letting. And then you'll see here is my kerning. And then here is gonna be my tracking. Okay, so some pretty funny words in typographical language, but they're also gonna be giving you a lot of power. So we really wanna kinda of know what these things are. Letting essentially is just your line spacing. That's really all we're talking about here. So if I decrease this, Notice how the lines get a little bit closer to each other, 
All right, and of course, this is gonna be dependent on the font size you even start with. So I'll just make that about that, about 15. I like that, that's pretty good, All right? And I click away, all right, I like that. Now in the future, I may save this as a, guess what, paragraph style, so then I can then apply it to all the rest of these. No problem, I'll do that in just a bit, all right? So that's wonderful, that's great. But now let's go ahead and explore some other things. My kerning and also my tracking. So let me just go ahead and first just move my mouse right in between the B and the U so we can see a little bit about what kerning actually is. Let me just bring this down a tiny, tiny bit. And notice what's happening. I'm having all the control in the world that I need between those two letters. Let me go ahead and just do it right here. Let's bring that in. Maybe I wanna be a little more creative about this, but more importantly, sometimes words, when they come together, they, or excuse me, letters, when they come together, it's gonna to look like something else, right? So you kinda of wanna be aware of that, that it, like some letters, like if it's an L that's leaning up against, you know, a C or something like that could like reflect, it's gonna look like something else, right? So you really wanna kinda of pay attention to these things and know that you have control over the space of individual letters between each other. So let me just go ahead and just give that a little more space, a little more space. And we'll see, okay, great, that's pretty easy. That essentially is what our kerning does. What does tracking do? Tracking will affect the entire word going across. So let's just try this now. See that? Maybe I wanna make this look a little bit more kind of tidily. You see that? So it actually, it's gonna go a little bit across there, right? So it's gonna kind of spread a little more. Let's just try it with these guys here. All right, let's just make that go a little further out. You can see, very nice, very easy. That spreads everything out a little more. Everything I'm showing you here is about controlling your topography, right? Whether it's your line spacing, your kerning, or your tracking. All right, now there's a lot more we can explore. Let's just play around with maybe just a few more here. Let me go back to another document here. Let's just go to, let's see, let's go to here and let's just play around with some other things that are gonna be available for us. Do we want this to be in all caps or not? Notice this is all set to be all caps. You can make that change, but I want it to be small caps. Notice how that's going to change. All right, maybe I'm gonna turn that off. So now it looks like regular case or sentence case. All right, that's great. Notice there's also another option for underlining, superscript, subscript, and even strike through if you want it. All right, so great, great, like that, good stuff. So again, just know what your options are here. Now again, you will see that you're gonna see a lot of the same options that we just saw here under character, all right, and potentially under paragraph. One thing you'll wanna notice about what properties does is that it's going to actually hide some of the options that are gonna be available for you right here. See that? It's gonna hide it for you. So you gotta click on those three dots to then see some of the options that may not be there. Like, oh, there's my kerning, there's my letting, there's my tracking, okay, cool. So again, let me click on the three dots, click on them again. All right, wonderful, that's great. All right, and the same thing for paragraph. If you're not seeing what you want, click on the three dots and oh my goodness, there's so many things just hiding there. It's just really designed to kind of give you a little more screen real estate, all right? So, and again, this is really all about how you're controlling all of your content. All right, so let me come back to here and let's just now play around with some of our kind of more, let's go to our paragraph stuff here. All right, so let's go now to the other section within this panel. Remember, this is going to be here. Looks like a little backwards P or a paragraph symbol. And you'll see there's a lot of options here that I can work with. All right, so some of my basic alignment options, left, center, right, okay, that's great. Here's also my options for indenting. So I have this whole paragraph selected just by simply clicking on it, and I can now indent the whole paragraph. Notice I didn't have to select the entire paragraph because it speaks for the whole paragraph just by virtue of the fact that I've moved my mouse inside of the paragraph. You also may wanna have a first line indent. So I click on that and then, oh, that's how you do that. 
Great, so I know I want it to be exactly half an inch. I can very easily do that. And then likewise with the rest of these, you'll really want to kind of experiment with like what's going to work for you. Right indent, right last line right indent. You know, some of these are going to be a little less used, a little more obscure. So play around with those. Now, these two, I think, are going to be very important for you in terms of your typographic control for your layout. And this one is going to be space before and space after. All right. So the space after this is making this space come up how it's coming up right here with all that inside of there, right? This 0.25 inches. If I want it to come in a little bit more, notice how I can do that. It's all about control. See that or I want it to be it's just something different. See that? You can have more or less very easily by coming to these. This one here is just gonna be the space before, so we're just gonna move it down from whatever's above there. All right, so really cool stuff, very easy to execute. All right, and now the last thing I'm gonna show you here on this particular one before I, let me just move this back so this is gonna look a little bit better if I do it like this is something kind of neat is your drop cap option. So notice I have two options here. Let's just see what they do. What is a drop cap? I say one, two, oh, three, oh, that's kind of interesting. And okay, but what if I want to have it more than one letter? Oh, that's kind of cool. So you can have some kind of creative control over that. Like you've seen these in magazines before. They're like, oh, that's pretty cool that I can even make it say, all right, different words, oh. Nice, so really make it stand out, have some control over how your paragraph is gonna come out. All right, so let me just go ahead and bring this back down just to one, ah, kinda nice, All right? Try that with something else. Let me come down to here. I'm just gonna bring this up. Very nice, okay, excellent. And of course, it depends on what font you're in. Later on, we're gonna talk about how we can manipulate this as well. It's a little more advanced, but I think it's gonna be important for you how to manipulate this A to maybe be a different font. Totally up to you. All right, so I'm gonna take a little break right now and I'll have you just practice everything we've done up until this point within text. All right, pause the video and practice understanding all the properties around your paragraph, your character, everything that we've done here. And I also want you to either change it within your panel up on top, your control panel, or in your properties panel, wherever it is kind of floating for you. All right, just really get comfortable, use the documents that you have available for you in the course files, and just make sure you understand kind of what is kerning, what is letting, what is um, our tracking, you know, how we can change the font size, how we can work the paragraph spacing before and after. And if you have a document you wanna work on, just again, Try to play around with it and then play around with it until you, know, you get full kind of natural control over what each of these elements do so you know how you can then manipulate it moving forward on your own. All right, so we'll give you a little bit of a break, pause the video, and we'll come back and we'll do some more typographical stuff in just a bit. In this next lesson, we're going to learn how we can bring in text from other documents and from other file types. So your eyes do not deceive you here, but we are looking at a Word document, okay? And I've worked very hard to work on this Word document and I wanna be able to bring it into InDesign so then I can manipulate it and do all kinds of different things to it. Now you'll notice how this looks here and it's got all kinds of different styles and everything like that. It's got all kinds of different formatting on here that I actually don't want. I mean, I'm going to do it myself when I bring it into InDesign, but think about, you know, this is like a different language. You know, just think about like, you know, you speak German and you're going to try to go over to Spain. These are different languages. You know, they're in the same kind of world a little bit, but no one's going to really understand each other. Or there's going to be like some words that might overlap, you know, let's say Portuguese and French, right? Those might overlap with each other, but there's going to be a little bit of a disconnect. Okay. So... What we want to do is bring it in and we're going to say, listen, I just want your text. So let's just see how this process works. And again, imagine your scenario where you're going to have a whole bunch of text that's already been created and you want to just bring it in to your InDesign document. I'm going to show you a few different ways to do this. All right, so I'm going to close this out, come back to InDesign, 
And I'm just gonna go ahead and create a blank new document for myself. Okay, that's great. So I'm just gonna make go ahead and make this this size, and then let's just make it three pages for right now. It's great. I click on create, and it's gonna be a blank new document. There it is. You can see get it brought in the unit of measure this time. Wonderful. There are my three pages. It's excellent. Now, how do I bring in all that text? Earlier, we talked about how do we bring in images. We did that through placing, 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 placing. It's the same exact thing that we do with text. So I'm going to click on File. I'm going to go over here to Place or just Control D. And I'm going to go into my Courseware files here. And I'm going to find a Word document that is ready to go for me. And this is known as the cookbook text. And you'll find that in your courseware as well. Now, earlier when we brought in our images, I told you to uncheck right this right here if it was already checked, your show import options. Okay, so this guy right here, you do not want that checked when you're working with images, but when you know, we are working with text, I definitely, def definitely recommend that you do that. So we're gonna click on that and we're gonna see why. It's very important. I'm gonna click on this text right now. It's a Word document and a dialog box is gonna pop up asking me a whole bunch of things. What do you want and what don't you want? All right, do you, if you have a table of contents and index and all that stuff, do you want that? Sure, maybe, maybe not, totally up to you. For formatting. Do you want to preserve the styles and formatting from text and table? Maybe, maybe not. Or do you want to remove the styles and formatting from text and tables? Okay, I'm going to suggest like 99% of the time that you do, guess what? Remove the styles and formatting from your text. Why? Because we need to give it basically a clean bill of health, right? Just start from a clean slate that it just belongs to InDesign. We do not want it to inherit any of the stuff from Word. InDesign just gonna get confused because what we're gonna do is we're gonna put all of the InDesign language on there. And then we're also gonna put our own, guess what? Styles on here using paragraph styles and also character styles. All right, so this is great. I click OK. And now notice my mouse has this little sort of extra backpack there waiting for me to bring in my egg recipes. All right, this is going to be the first way that we can bring in type, okay, by placing it. Just watch me here. I'm just going to go ahead and click and drag. And I let go. And it's like, oh, okay, that's not everything. So I just clicked and dragged, and okay, that was good, not great. Oh, but you will notice that that there's this little red plus sign there. That's InDesign telling me that, oh, there's more stuff for you to do. So, oh, okay, I can grab more. Oh, we just, you know, we got cut off here. No problem. Click on this and then bring this in very manually, right? It's like, okay, great. I can do that. Cool. Oh, you know, I'm still not done. Oh, man. Okay. Now, let's just say this time I want to do two columns. So I can just do that. All right, and then keep going. Maybe there's gonna be an advertisement up here. So I'm just gonna make this kind of like halfway. Still not done, oh man, I am so out of breath right now. This is gonna take a long time. I now have to add on new pages, which you certainly can do, right? If I just right click on my little thumbnail here, I'm gonna say insert pages, and maybe I'm gonna add on another five pages. All right, and I could continue going on all day long with this, okay? Not ideal. Sometimes it's gonna be the case where you're gonna do things incredibly manual, like this, okay? But we're not gonna do it that way. I'm gonna show you two other ways to do it, maybe even with a bonus of three other ways. So this time I'm gonna create another new document and I'm gonna make it, so again, this is about maybe five pages long. I'm gonna click Create, All right? Blank new one here. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna to go to File and Place, Show Import Options, click on Cookbook Text, all right, remove styles, all good to go, fantastic. But this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold down the Alt key or Option key on my keyboard if you're on a Mac. And I want you to notice how it changes the cursor a little bit when I hold down the Option key. Do you see a little the Alt key on the PC? All right, and watch what this is gonna do. This was known as semi-automatic text placement. So when I click and drag on this and I let go, 
Notice how I still have this guy waiting for me here, okay? I have not let go of my thumb on the Alt key here, right? I can click on that, great. And then let me just come back over to here, put my finger back on the Alt key, and you can see that it's still kind of like locked and loaded for me to kind of put this wherever I want. I don't have to go to that little plus sign and then find it there. All right, okay, pretty cool. All right, great. And I just kind of, there's my add there, right? I'm just holding on the Alt key, great. See that, that's the main difference. So this is semi-automatic, okay? And then I'm just gonna click once, and then go bam, which just blasts it all out. And see, I still didn't finish it all. Oh, man, I didn't put enough pages in there. Good golly. So what am I gonna do next? Let's create a new document. I'll show you the third option. And this time, just for fun, just so you can see the power of this, I'm gonna make this just like two pages because I don't even know how long this document is, all right? I do that, it's only two pages. But this time, I'm gonna use this, the automatic way of placing text. And that's gonna be using the Shift key, the Shift key. So I'm gonna go over here to File Place, right? Show Import Options, Cookbook Text, right? Everything's good there. Click OK. And now watch what happens when I hold down the Shift key. This time, I'm not holding down the Alt key. I'm not holding down nothing. I'm holding down the Shift key. And I'm just gonna simply just click once. And guess what happened? It created a new page, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh my God, look at that, awesome. It went all the way down and it created the new pages for me based off the size of the document. All right, so placing your stuff is really gonna depend on what you want to do as far as how automatic you want InDesign to be for you, okay? So again, we saw three different ways. One is gonna be very, very manual. Another is gonna be semi-automatic. And this last one was very automatic where it just plopped everything out and created the new pages for you. All right, let's do that one more time in another way that you may prefer also. So again, totally up to you. And this time I'm going to say new, and I'm gonna say, just, just to guess, I'm gonna say 10 pages. I'm gonna say this time it's got two columns, all right? Good to go, that's great. And then just because we haven't seen these yet, I'm gonna go ahead and click on facing pages. It's great, all right, and then let me just see what the preview looks like. Do I really like that? Let's increase our gutter. Let's see what that looks like. I'm gonna switch this back to inches so I can speak my language. All right, I'll just go there. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Now, and I get all these pages here. That's great. And see, these are facing pages, right? except for the first page. That's just how it works. And let's now see what happens when I have my facing pages with my columns and I use, guess what? The automatic feature with this. So let's just see the magic of this. So this time I'm using my keyboard shortcut. Hopefully you got this down by now. Control D, I'm going to click on this right here. It all looks great, fantastic, I click OK. And this time, watch what happens now when I hold down the Shift key and I just click here. And then look what it did. It not only filled it all in automatically, but it knew that there are columns and it applied it accordingly because I set those columns up beforehand. Okay, really, really awesome stuff here. It's just understanding all the power to save you a lot, a lot of time and a lot of headaches getting ready of how you bring in some text from the outside, whether it's just a basic text document, a Word document, okay, and how you can work with all those little nuances, all those little modifiers, all right? So when we come back, we're gonna learn a little bit about text boxes themselves, and then we're gonna get into actually working with paragraph and cell styles, all right? So please practice all this and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, following up on our last exercise where we placed some text in, you'll notice that some of the text boxes have come in not necessarily looking how I want them to look. Now, sometimes it's gonna be the case where it's gonna come in as just one column. How can we actually make it look the way that it looked like when we finally had the two columns here, right? Or three columns, whatever we wanna do, all right? So how can I manipulate this text box to look in kind of different ways? 
So very simply, if I right click on my text box, you're going to see that there's this option for text frame options, or there's my control B. I click on that and you can see very simply, I have this section here called columns and another section here called number of columns and another one asking me what is going to be the gutter. All right, we talked about gutter a little bit. We talked about columns initially and we'll see, okay, well, what do I want to do with this particular text box? How many columns do I want to do? So let's just see what happens when I change this from one to two. Oh, that's great. Or three. Oh, wow. looks more like the Wall Street Journal, right? New York Times, right? Maybe that's what you're trying to do. Wonderful. So I'm just going to bring this right back to two. And then I'm going to just manipulate my gutter. So I just can add more space between columns. Super easy. Okay. Really, really great, really powerful to be able to control your content and show it how you want to show it. All right. Great. So I love that. Now, another thing you may want to do is manipulate the inset spacing. So the inset spacing is going to be the space, kind of the padding. It's going to be where the line of the text box is from where the actual text is. Now, when is it going to be an example of when you're going to do that? It's typically, if you're going to have some color, right? That's actually a really good example because if you have color, you want a little bit of white space you know, on this. So therefore the text does not kind of bleed directly on that color. So I'll just give you an example here. So I'm just going to click OK for right now and I'm just going to add on some color to this. So this is an object just like anything else. So I can bring in some color just like I did for my shapes in earlier lessons. So I'm going to double click on that. I'll just do this nice light ish blue color. I click on that and see how that's really not that easy to read. All right, you can see, yeah, not, not very pretty. And I need a little bit of white space here. Love this color, but I need to manipulate all these options here through my text frame options to be able to change all my inset spacing. So making sure that preview is chosen. I'm just now going to just click on any one of these. And because this is now linked, it's going to change all four, the top, bottom, left, and right. And it's going to make this much, much easier to read. See that? As simple as that. And you have all the control in the world to be able to make that happen. Now, if I wanted this to be the same for all the rest of these, what could I possibly do? Any guesses? What could I do to now apply this to this, to this, to this, to this, to this across the board? I'll wait for you to think about it. Tick tock, tick tock. Object styles object styles. Okay. Anytime you want to repeat something, try it out with object styles. And let's just do a little review on how that would play out with an object style. So I'm going to create an object style based off of this because that took me so long and remember what I did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this as an object style. So let's go up to window. Let's go over here to styles, object styles. All right. And then what I'm going to do is simply just click on this, make a style based off of what I have selected here. Click on alt or option. And I'm going to say blue text box to columns. All right. That's great. Certainly spot check all this. If you want to apply style to selection preview. Excellent. That's great. And now guess what? Come down to here. Bam. Look at that. Oh, that's so cool. All right. You can see working with object styles once again. And even though we're working with a text box, I want you to understand that a text box is also known as an object. All right. So you really, really want to understand this and practice all this. Okay. So really, really get this, understand the value of it. All right. So maybe you want to change the color of this. And then this would change the color for every single one of these selected, just like how we did in the last exercise with our drop shadows. Okay. So go ahead, pause the video. I want you to go over to your text frame options, make some changes to your columns, add some columns, add the gutter. Okay. And then add some color. And then you'll notice that you're going to need to change your inset options to be able to add some padding. And then I really want you to practice making whatever you do as an object style and then apply it to the rest of them. All right. Really harness the power of InDesign. Okay. 
InDesign wants you to use these styles and also get under the hood a little bit with some of these text frame options. All right, so practice up and we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, a few additional items that I want to discuss with regard to text boxes is going to be text threads. And also you're going to see sometimes we're going to have our text boxes that are not going to be complete. And you'll see that sometimes you'll see a little error as a result of that. So let's just see kind of what we can do to resolve some of these issues and also just to kind of look under the hood a little bit. So sometimes when you have documents that look like this or going from one page to another, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell where one text box sort of threads to another, you know, because you might actually have an image here. You might have an advertisement. You might have a completely blank page. You might also have some text boxes just kind of fly off into kind of outer space and you're like, well, where is this going to? Where is it coming from? So this is where text threads come into play. So when I click on this, you'll notice I'm actually seeing the thread of like one text box leading to another, leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. That's great. Now I can actually see where they all go. You'll also notice that down here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit and click on that. I have this little guy right there that's telling me, oops, I've run out of space here. So how am I even able to see all these little threads here? What's even going on for me to allow that? Because for you, a lot of you may not even be seeing these little threads there. If you go up here to view and you go down here to extras, you're going to see there's this option to show text threads. So notice how they go away, right? Because I just hid them. Go back over here to view, go over here to extras and then say show text threads. Now, of course, when you're in W mode, with the with and the without, you're not always going to see it, right? You click on that see it's not showing up. But when I hit W to now make it show all my markings and everything, then I'm going to be able to see those little text threads. OK, so really kind of valuable, especially when you have those kind of documents that I discussed earlier, as far as, you know, like going onto different pages, it's going to jump someplace else. You might have images, advertisements, whatever you have. OK, so you can see that's kind of nice how that works. Now I can also just move this and you'll see how the thread will follow along just like that. So you can see it. And if this was going to go way down here, see the thread now follows and it goes exactly where the next text box is. Okay. That's kind of nice. You can say, all right, great. And this could be like 50 pages down. It might even be someplace even more kind of preposterous like over here and it still follows it. You know, I've worked on with clients before where they have these like huge books and like 20 people are working on it. You know, it's over the span of like 20 years and people are moving things around. And I was like, oh, wait, we can't find things sometimes. Like, well, where is that? Oh, wait a second. Let's turn on the text threads and let's see where these things live. Right. So there's a lot of value to that. Let me just go ahead and undo and bring this back. And then we're going to go ahead and resolve this issue of our little red plus sign. OK. A lot of times we may miss this, okay? We may not even realize this, but you know who is, isn't missing it is InDesign because you can see way on the bottom, you can see is one error. And if I double click on that, it's gonna tell me text, overset text, and there is a text frame issue on, guess what? Page five, okay? So you can see that, that's what that means. It's basically saying, hey, on page five, there's a text frame issue, okay? well. What is that? Oh, I see it now. So you can see all I need to do is simply click on this and then I get a very similar cursor like I did when I placed my text with a little backpack here saying, well, where do you want the text to go? So I'm just going to go ahead and click or click and drag either one and then bam, it's going to go there and look how many errors I got. 0, 0.00. Awesome. OK, so it's a great way to just kind of have a nice little airtight ship. Now. The last thing I want to show you here is the ability to actually show some of the markings in the background of our text, okay? Because that's going to be sometimes important to see, is this a hard return? Is it a tab? Is it a line break? You might want to know these things because it's going to help you kind of determine why things aren't doing what they're doing sometimes and how to take the necessary action. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so we can see the markings when I bring them up. And how do I do that? It's going to be under type. 
Right? You click on that and you're going to see wait on the bottom here is show hidden characters. And you'll see, oh, okay, look at that. These are my hidden characters, right? All these little paragraph signs basically mean that they're all separated out by a hard return. All these little dots there just basically means that somebody hit the space bar a few times. See that? Look at that. Now I see all those. And if there's tabs, you might see tabs occasionally. See, this is what a tab looks like. So it's kind of nice to see these occasionally just to be able to identify like, well, what in fact is going on as I um, just basically do some of these markings, some of these basic markings, but again, just to ultimately troubleshoot, right? Like what in fact is going on and why? Oh, it's just a hard return. Oh, it's a tab. Oh, it's just space or whatever it is to be able to see all that. Okay. Now, another thing that's going to come up for you is when you're bringing in actual text boxes themselves, right? We've done that before. You may actually want to have some placeholder text. Why might you want to have placeholder text? Sometimes you don't have the copy all ready to go, but placeholder text is going to allow you to just basically have a placeholder so then you can format it. You can see what it's going to look like with your line spacing, with your font, your size, your color, the background, right? All that good stuff here. So I'm just going to do a very, very simple text box. Just click and drag. I let go. All right. And I have no text here, but I want to know what it's going to look like. So guess what? Right inside of my type menu, you will see there's an option way down at the bottom is fill with placeholder text, right? Everybody see that? Fill with placeholder text. Click on that and look at that. Just fills in with this kind of like dummy sort of Latin um, gobbledygook. All right, and you'll see, okay, this is what it's gonna look like. Fantastic, all right? I can just replace that later on if I want to, but you'll see it's very easy just to fill it in also with some placeholder text, all right? So these last few things are just some good, um, just uh, reminders and good sort of, you know, finished polishings of all of your text elements, you know, just to make sure that everything is sort of under control for you as you're working with type. So like we've done in all of our other videos, what I want you to do is pause the video, practice everything we just did in this lesson. I want you to practice turning on your text threads. I want you to practice drawing out new text boxes. I want you to practice bringing in placeholder text. If you see the little red plus sign, I want you to um, move that someplace else, right? Just basically expand it out. I want you to make sure that you have no errors down below in case you have some overset text and pretty much like keep an eye on that no matter what you do, because it could be links and images and all that good stuff um, as you're working on this to make sure that everything is pretty airtight when it comes time to finally publish. All right, have fun and we'll see you in the next lesson. Earlier, we discussed the great phenomenon of working with object styles where we can save the look and feel and the format of a particular object and then use it over and over again. And remember, object styles work on text boxes, on images, on shapes, you know, any kind of like object type of object, right? Now, next thing we're going to talk about is paragraph styles. All right, now I have this newsletter template document open up. And I'm just going to show you this really great document and how it's all structured using paragraph styles. We're going to be able to see this in action so we can see like, wow, that is phenomenal. How could I create something like this to be more efficient, okay, to be consistent, okay, to have some branding around it and also just really expedite my processes but using paragraphs this time instead of working with objects. So the first thing I want to do before I do anything at all is go over here to my window and go to styles and then bring up my paragraph styles. And I'm just gonna just bring this over here, minimize this over here. And then you'll see that when I click on, let's say for example, here I'm on page eight, I go inside here, there is a paragraph style called titles and that's what's set up here as well. Now you'll also notice in my properties panel that it also shows titles. So you can keep an eye on both of these. So this is in fact the paragraph style name that is associated with this. So what exactly does that mean? It's a saved format, 
right, with a whole bunch of things to make it this Acumen Pro Bold 66 point, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take a look at another one. Let's come down here to where it says name here. This is staff name. What's this one? Oh, also staff name, also staff name. Oh, I see a pattern here because if I change my paragraph style, and all the parameters associated with it, all three of these things will change, just like how I saw with my object style. Let's take a look at another one. Let's go over here to title. That's pretty cool. All right, what about this one? Is that, oh, oversized titles and also oversized. Oh, that's another style. How cool is that? What's this one? This is titles again. Is there one for this one? Okay, oh, cover page dates. Oh, man. All right, everything is saved here as a style. Let's try this one. Subheading. Right? Nothing is left behind because guess what? I'm going to use this to make consistent and very quick and efficient changes on everything that's connected to this particular style. All right. And that's why I create styles. That's why I use styles. So I have a lot of these subheadings. All right. And my boss comes over and says, oh, listen, you know what? We're not going to use that font anymore. I'm like, oh, dude, are you serious? I have this on like 100 pages. Oh, but didn't you use a style? You, you, oh, you know what? I did. Thank God I did. All right. So all you need to do is just change the style settings. And then it's going to change it for all of them. Oh, that's right. So let's just see it in action. And we're going to see how we can create them. So very simply, notice how subheading is selected because my text is selected. I double click that. And now this is going to take me into my paragraph style options. It looks very different than my object style options, doesn't it? Okay, I think even easier to work with. You'll see the first thing you'll notice is all of my style settings. Basically, what is defining all of this, right? It's Acumen Pro, bold, 15 points, tracking of this. And it's, okay, and it's centered. Okay, cool. That's fantastic, right? But I want to actually make a change to that. So if I go over to any one of these on the left-hand side, I can make a change. I, let's say going over here to basic character formats and then watch what happens now when I make this a little bit bigger. Notice how all of them change. Let's make them smaller. Wait for it. Just trying to catch up a little bit. Okay, all the ones that are associated with it then get smaller. All right, I'm going to click OK. Now let's make sure that this, in fact, is subheading. There we go. Just take a little bit of time to catch up. Scared me for a second. And then notice how it changed across the board. Oh my God, that's amazing. Let's now go over here to one that I definitely saw a lot of. Go to here to title. Just simply double click on this. Great. And I can see there's all my settings there. That's 66 basic character formats. Oh, cool. And I can change. Let's just bring up the tracking a little bit. You'll notice how it's going to make it nice and big. Let's go over to here to case. Let's make that all caps. Great. Love that. That's going to be across the board. And then just for fun, let's go to a different one like our character color. And you can see this is actually all connected to some saved colors, right? So I can go to there and then bam, there it is. Or very simply, I can then double click on this T and then I can play around with some of my color parameters here just the same if you want to. We haven't really talked to this degree about colors yet, but I want you to at least know in case you are comfortable with it, that you can either go to your swatches here or double click on it and then make some color changes here as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and just click okay for right now. I love that, that's great. Now there's a lot, a lot of options that you can change within our paragraph style. Of course, it'll be up to you what you wanna do. At this point, I want you to know A, that paragraph styles are awesome, how to identify them, how to manipulate them, right? And really ultimately to see the value in them, all right? Because soon in this next lesson within this same video, we're going to learn how we can create them, all right? So let me go ahead and click OK, and let's just take a look at all of our other titles. Yep, all caps and yellow. Oh, look at that, all caps and yellow. Remember before, these were all black, and I made one change right here, and it changed it for all of them. All right, just phenomenal. So let's just now take a look at the document that we started with earlier, which is going to be our little recipes, all right? Now, 
I have no paragraph styles happening here, right? Nothing, zero, zero, zero. So everything, I want to click on this, is just a basic paragraph, okay? Kind of boring, right? Just this Minion Pro. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new style, you know, based off of what I've either selected here, right? Very nice and easy. That's great. Or I can even just do it right here. I'm going to say basic paragraph, double click on it, and then I can make the change to whatever I want. Okay. So let's just go ahead and do the latter. I'm going to make this so my font is going to be something a little bit different. Let's come way back up on top here. I'm going to choose Berlin Sands, and you'll notice that everything changes to Berlin Sands. Let's make that Berlin Sands bold. Notice how everything does because they're all connected to that basic paragraph. I'm going to switch that back. Maybe make that a little bit bigger. Okay, great. Maybe a little smaller. You can see how everything changes. And I'm going to simply click OK. And now that is going to be my basic paragraph. And that's going to be for everything. But I have a whole bunch of headings here. I've got a heading here, a subheading, etc. Let's now do that. Let's now create new headings and subheadings and save them as styles. First thing you want to do is create what you want it to look like on the front end and then save your style in the paragraph styles panel and then you can execute accordingly across the board. If that sounds familiar, it's literally the same thing we did with the object style. So let's now go ahead and just make some changes to this just this particular one here, all right? Make that nice and big. I'm going to make that all caps. That's great. And then let's just maybe bring up our tracking a little bit. And I'm also going to go over here to my paragraph and I'm going to just say, hey, listen, I need a little bit of space after you because you're a title. You need all the room to stretch your arms out. Okay, that's fantastic, all right? And then maybe you want to change the color. So I'm going to go over here to this T, double click on it, choose whatever color you want. Maybe you want to add it to the swatches to save it. Totally up to you. Click OK. And there you have it. All right. And I love that. And I want that applied for everybody else. That's going to be a title. So very simply, with this still selected, hold down the Alt or Option key, click on Create New Style. And I'm just going to call this Actually, let's call this recipe categories. Great. And you can see there's verification of everything I just did. I'm not going to make any changes to it, but I am going to choose apply style to selection, just like I said earlier for my, my object styles. And I'm going to click OK. All right. And there it is, recipe categories. Now, if we go down here, you're going to see that there's a number of different categories we can work with, like lunch dishes. That's a new category. So I'm going to say recipe category. Oh, look at that. Awesome. Let's try another one. Now let's go to sauce. Amazing. All right, let's try another one. We have a different kind of thing here. We got sauce. That's going to be a new one down over here. Let's say sides and appetizers. And notice I'm just clicking in there and watch this. Bam, it does the whole paragraph. So awesome. And again, if I'm going to make a change, I can make a change directly to the style and it's going to change everything associated with that style. All right. So absolutely amazing. So let's just do that. Finish up that thought and let's just make this a little bit smaller. And then just for fun, I'll show you one kind of neat thing while I'm here. This is known as a paragraph rule that I think you might appreciate. So I'll just throw this in. So paragraph rule, not like rule like a law, it's a rule as in like a line. So while I'm here, I'm just going to add on like a little line that's going to go underneath every single one of these. So it really makes it stand out. So you'll see here, our paragraph rules, paragraph rules. Do I want my rule above the paragraph or below? I want it to be below and just simply say rule on. That's kind of cool. All right, and then what's the weight going to be? How thick do I want that to be? All right, three points, not bad. And then do I want it to be the same color as my text? Yep, yeah, that's pretty good. And if you go over to here, the right-hand side, you'll say, okay, I want this to be offset just a little bit by that much. And I'll see, oh, that's a little bit too much. Can't really see everything. 
my screen size. Let's do perfect. I love that. And maybe some of you want to experiment with the type that you do. All right. So again, I can do wavy Japanese dots, any of these things, just like how we saw with our strokes, you can see, oh, that's kind of fun. I like that. And then you'll want to play around with that. All right. So I click OK. And now guess what? When I go back up to all my other ones, you will see everything that had that applied to it. My recipe category now has that wavy line going across the board. Why? Because of paragraph styles. All right, and you'll really wanna just play around with this. There's so many different parameters that you can apply this in. In our next lesson, we're gonna be getting into bullets and numbering, and we'll be able to see how we can also save those as paragraph styles. All right, so pause the video, practice what we've done here, working with paragraph styles, saving them, and then applying them across the board, and then making changes in our paragraph style to see the power. All right, see you in the next lesson. This lesson is gonna be about working with bullets and numbering, and we'll see how easy it is to implement them, and then more importantly, how easy it is to then implement them across the board using our paragraph styles. All right, so how do we do that? So first thing I want you to notice is again, when you select your text, right? I'm gonna have these guys that I want to make into, you know, my, my uh, ingredients, right? This is what I need to have, okay? That's great, fantastic. But then I need to find all my options for bullets and numbering. One of two places you're going to find it. So if we go way up on top here, you're going to see here's a bullet and here is number. The other place you're going to see it, of course, is in the properties panel. So let me just go ahead and move this up. Move this here so you can see a little bit better. If you scroll down, you'll be able to see all kinds of different options, including bullets and numbering. And you'll also see some extra options that I can work with here. So just very simply, Highlight these, make them into bullets. Oh, that's easy. Make them into numbers. Oh, that's easy. Cool, right? However you want to do that, that's great. Now, I don't really like how these are set up. In other words, like I want this to be a little more indented. I want them to be a little closer to each other. So that's where my options come in. So I click on that. And you're going to see how I have a lot of different options here in terms of the bullet character I want to use. I can change this from bullets to numbers very quickly or just say none at all. Totally up to you. If you wanted to add in different kind of bullets, you can do that. If you click on add, you can kind of go hunting for them, just like different characters and graphics and stuff like that. That's not what we're going to get into here, but I encourage you to experiment with that. But what we're going to do here is have a little bit of control over our margins, essentially, in our indenting settings. So very simply, I'm just going to click on this and you can see I can indent. Oh, I love that. And then if I change this to first in line, first line indent, that's going to make the change of where the bullet is going to go. It's kind of strange language, but it gives me the option to really control it. So it's really all I need to know. And I love this, right? This is great. This is what I want to use for all of my bullets moving forward. I click OK. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to save this as a paragraph style. So I can just simply click on any one of these, doesn't matter. And hold down my Alt or Option key, click on the plus sign. I'm going to name this bullets, right? See all my settings there. Everything's all good. Click OK. And now watch this. I'm just going to highlight these guys here. And then very simply, choose bullets. Looks exactly the same. It's so cool. Just tried another one. Just simply click and drag bullets. Okay. Of course I can go on and on and on, but I really want you to see again, another example outside of just basic text manipulation, how we can do it with bullets and numbering and all of the margin and spacing options around working with bullets. All right. So definitely experiment with that. Now let's see some other things we can work with, with paragraph styles that may help you out. All right. Now, if we go back to the document that we were in earlier, see here is our newsletter. I want you to notice that these have um, individual uh, groupings in them, right? For different purposes. Okay. So you, once you start having a lot, a lot of styles, you may want to organize them, right? Into this little new styles group. So very easy to do that, right? Once you have one, you just simply click on the folder option there, and then it's going to put it into a group. 
for you. All right, so if I go over to here, and then maybe I'm just gonna put these guys inside of a group. So hold down the shift key, click on this, all right, and then drag them inside of here. And now I have a new style group, highlight that, and then I'll just call this my basic style, whatever, okay? And then I can then just start building out more and more and more. And as I create more paragraph styles, I can then put them inside of these groups. All right, so being organized, super important, super helpful, especially when you start working in a collaborative environment with other people. So you can see how helpful this is to be able to recognize where things are, um, what they're called, what their purpose is, et cetera. All right, so practice that. All right, if you haven't started working with styles yet in terms of the paragraph styles or working with object styles, I highly, highly encourage you to pause the video and really practice it. Practice it and perfect it and get it into this sort of muscle memory for you and see how you can apply it in some of your own documents. All right, so pause the video, practice that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. All right, now that we have talked about object styles and paragraph styles, let's give a quick little nod over to character styles. All right, so character styles are unlike paragraph styles where it doesn't actually apply it to an entire paragraph. It just applies it either to just like one character or one word, but it's a little more precise over where you apply it. All right, so I'm gonna show you how we can do it. It's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna show you just a nice little trick you can do to make it kind of go across the board with all of your, that particular word you're looking for, for an example. All right, so let's just say, for example, I have you know, the word, you know, eggs inside of here. And every time I have the word eggs in there, I want it to be a certain color and all that good stuff here. All right. So again, I'm going to do this on the front end, like I've done in the past. All right. So I'm going to make this bold. Okay. That's great. And then let's just make this a different color. Let's make that stand out. All right. And lovely. That's great. Now I'm going to make that into a style. So I have it highlighted and then, oops, wait, this is my paragraph style. I don't want to do a paragraph style based off of this. So what do I need to do? Oh, oh, that's right. We're working with character styles. So I don't need this one anymore. So let's just go ahead and dock this over there. Go over to my window and come down here to styles and bring up character styles. Understand the distinction. Let's bring this over here. And then notice this has none. There is no character style associated with this yet until I now create it. So making sure that what you just created on the front end is selected, hold down the Alt key or Option key on the Mac, click on Create New Style, and I'm just gonna call this Eggs. Great, and then you can see, bam, there it all is there. Okay, that's great. I can, of course, make some changes to this, whatever you wanna do, and I'm good to go, all right? And that, that's all that is. All right, I've just made that. And that could really be applied to anything. I just arbitrarily call that eggs because like I could make this also say that as well. I don't want to do that. But just understand what we can do for character styles where it could just be one word. Now, I want every instance of the word eggs that's inside of our, you know, our main paragraph here to have the same color here and have that all the same stuff here. So I'm going to show you a nice little trick that's working with find and replace, find and replace. Some of you maybe worked with find and replace in other capacities where you're finding a word and you're replacing it with another word. You know, it could be like, you know, a company, right? Your, your new product, right? A new employee, you're just saying, okay, Bob doesn't work here anymore, but now Mary does. Great, replace Bob with Mary. Oh, that's fantastic, right? You can do that in InDesign, absolutely. So I'm gonna show you that basic part, but I'm also gonna show you how you can find every instance of the word eggs and replace not the word, but the style, replace the format of it. So if we go over to here to edit, you're gonna see here's an option for find and change. And also notice here is the control F option or command F on the Mac. And what am I looking for? I am looking for the word eggs. Great. And you can see here it says change to what? I'm not changing anything. So this really should be blank, All right? That's great. So I'm not really changing the words. 
What am I changing? I'm changing the format. All right, now you can also see there's some other kind of like advanced parameters here, including case sensitive. So I don't want it to change any of the caps. So I'm going to just say it's case sensitive. And then I'm gonna say, hey, change the format of eggs. I'm not changing the words, so this should be blank. And I'm gonna click on this. And you'll notice what's gonna pop up. It's asking me in very simple language, well, do you wanna change the character style? Oh, yes I do, I wanna change it to eggs, look at that. There's only one option available for me. That's the only one I created. So it's pretty straightforward. I click OK. And if you read this, it says here, find what? Find eggs and make sure it's case sensitive. So it's going to be the small e. And then make sure it's going to be the character style of eggs for all of them. All right, so let's see it in action. I'm going to say change all what 19 replacements and it found all the eggs oh my god that is huge love that click okay click done oh my god that is amazing are there other eggs here yes there's eggs there right it finds all the instance of eggs in my entire document so i don't have to do that so really really slick and then guess what if i make this change to say hey listen we're going to actually change the color of the eggs character style go over to here to my character color and this time let's just make it green and you can see that I got my green eggs and ham all set up ready to go and again I worked with styles but this time it's a character style and I showed you how you can do it in kind of a slick way working with find and replace so you'll definitely want to practice that pause the video see how that works for you and then if you haven't noticed I also created some other sub paragraph styles so you want to kind of challenge yourself stretch yourself out a little bit and so you see what you can do with working with your paragraph styles not just what i showed you here with this big one but then go a little bit deeper with those and then practice what i did with my eggs working with the find and replace and then also try some other ones find your document and then see what you can do to really hone your skills and get this muscle memory perfect it and then make your life and your job that much easier. All right, we'll see you in the next lesson. So we're gonna switch up gears a little bit and start talking about color. You'll see that in pretty much every document you work with, color is gonna have an important appeal and visual interest for a variety of different reasons. It could be the type you're working with, it could be a shape, Right, could be little objects here. It could be something that you're even drawing if you have the illustration skills. So um, earlier we talked about the different types of colors you might want to choose. RGB, you're going to work with if it's going to be just for um, the web or for screen. And you're going to work with CMYK if it's going to be for print. Okay, So you really want to know what your medium ultimately is going to be because you might be a little bit disappointed if you choose the wrong one and you send it to the printer and it doesn't look the way you want it to look. All right, so just establish that. I'm gonna show you how we can change some of those things as we're actually creating our colors as well. All right, now we have a few different places that we can change our colors. All right, so you can see here is my color picker right over here very easily and remember how we have our fill color and we also have our stroke. You'll also notice that I can do it up on top here and also you'll notice here is my appearance. Now, there's a few other panels we can work with as well. So if we go over here to window, you can see here is color, and there's going to be a color panel we can work with. Let's bring that out. And let's go over here to window again, color, and let's bring up our swatches. Great, let's go ahead and just dock those so they're all kind of one and the same here for us to work with. All right, now, if I click on this right here, you're gonna see this is the, currently the color that I'm working on, right? So if I click over to here, notice how this changes to a T. That's telling me that as I'm working with type, that is black, all right? Let me go over to here. This is type that is this nice little orange color. Great, you can see there's a T there, there's a T there, there's a T there, okay? So it's constantly sort of talking to us and letting us know kind of what's what. Now, if I wanna change this to a different color, I can very easily do that in a number of different ways. I can come over to here, double click, and then choose a color, right, bam. And then you can see this is my previous color. This is gonna be the next color, the one I just chose. Let me cancel that, come over to here, double click, 
same thing. And all my color options pop up just the same. And then I'll go over to here and you'll see slightly different thing pops up because it's giving me all my, what we call our swatches, which we're gonna explore. But again, I can then just simply double click on this and it takes me right to my color picker. Now there's gonna be times when you want to actually choose a color from the actual canvas itself. And we're gonna be exploring that in just a second. All right, so let me now go ahead and just apply a color, right? You can see very easily, I click okay. And now that shape has now changed color. All right, that's great, all right? Wonderful, love that. Right, let me do that one more time. And let me just choose this ish color kind of bright yellow now what i'm going to do this time is i'm going to show you how you can put in your rgb value if you know it or your cmyk value or your hexadecimal code value if you know what those things are you just type them in and you're good to go all right you can also change your hue saturation and brightness right or if you're working with any of these settings here you can change those too if you're that advanced or your company's working with them you can change all of these options here, and then it's gonna know essentially what to do for you. All right, now that is an option for us. But what I'm gonna do next is because I love this color so much, right? Let's just say I've put in my RGB value and I'm good to go. I can now add this, actually it's gonna be CMYK, right? I can add this, right, as my CMYK value, right, as a swatch, okay, as a swatch, right? Because I wanna save it. Right, that's what swatches are about. They're basically just saved colors. So I love that, that's great. I click okay. And now, all right, that's pretty cool, but where did it go, right? It's here, but I wanna use it for all my other documents, right? So if you go, or all my other objects, that is. So if you go over here to swatches, you will see it then gets added to my swatches panel. Do you see that there, right? Now, fantastic, there it is. I don't like how it's called it, but you can see it says, okay, C equals 14, M equals eight, et cetera. So really what I wanna do now is make a change to that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click once on it and then click again. It's kind of this double click, but slow motion. I'm just gonna call this lemon yellow sun. All right, I love that. Now let's see it in action because now that I've saved this, I can apply this in many, many different contexts. So let me go over to here to this guy. I click on my drop down, and guess what's waiting there for me at the bottom is Lemon Yellow Sun. All right, and I can keep doing that over and over and over again. Okay, that's great. Of course, you may know about paragraph styles at this point, and you'd know that I can then actually apply this using my paragraph style rather than doing it directly on here. All right, if we go to my paragraph style, you'll see that that is also talking to my swatches, okay? So you'll be able to see that all these things have a nice relationship with each other. So I know that this is the titles paragraph style. And when I open that up and I go into my character color, you'll notice that there is now lemon yellow sun that lives inside of here. Why? Because it's a swatch, all right? So I click on that. To apply lemon yellow sun, I click OK, and guess what's gonna happen? Everything that has this paragraph style of titles associated with it now has the lemon yellow sun. All right, so really cool, really slick. All right, so again, working with swatches, which is a saved color, working with paragraph styles, which is a saved format. So that way I have that kind of efficiency, all right? So my goal here is to really make you efficient and use InDesign in the way it's meant to be used, all right? So that is how we work with, you know, basically creating our basic colors, all right? That's fantastic. How we can save them, we can put in our RGB value or CMYK value, okay? And then save them as swatches and then incorporate them into our paragraph styles, all right? Great. So. That should help you with that. Now, you also may want to work with the color panel, right? Which might be a little bit more confusing for some of you. So, but I'll just show you kind of just like a little bit of a, a different way that you could use this, okay? So I'm gonna go over to here and you'll see that I'm going to be able to manipulate this right here to be able to kind of make that, okay, that's good, but I'm not seeing all my colors. 
So I'm showing you this because this is gonna happen a lot. Like it doesn't work that great with colors. So if I go over to here to my little flyout menu and I choose CMYK, oh, my flyout menu is kind of hiding everything right in there for me to then access every single color, then I can make my changes here on the fly. This is only if you wanna work with the color panel, totally up to you, however you wanna do this, really. I mean, it's just up to you. You can work with the color picker, you can work with color if you want to, um, the color panel that is. But again, really, really totally up to you. All right, now what I'm gonna do this time is I'm going to basically use the color picker to then just steal this color. So you can see how that's gonna work. So I have this still selected, come over to here, and then instead of doing any of these options here, I'm gonna use this little eyedropper. So how do you do that? You simply wanna hold down and click and drag to grab what you want. Don't let go. I mean, it's not like Photoshop where you can just click it once. You literally just click on there, and now it's got my color, I click OK. And see now I've applied it. And that could be anything that's on your document. All right. So you just kind of grab that color. All right. So practice that. Practice with colors. Um, working with our swatches, our all the things I said, the RGB, the CMYK, all that good stuff, and see how it all relates to your paragraph styles. Work with the eyedropper tool. Um, and then playing around with different ways that you can actually access your colors, right? Because notice how there's a whole bunch in kind of different places that you can do it just the same, right? So totally up to you. Now, we're going to take a little break for you to practice. And we come back, we're going to work with gradients. All right, so have fun and we'll see you in the next lesson. In the last lesson, we talked about basic colors, working with swatches, saving our colors, working with CMYK and RGB and all that good stuff. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about working with gradients. Now, what you're looking at here is a gradient where we're basically making one kind of like graduation from white to gray to black, right? Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to do that just for kind of like texture, for visual interest, for kind of dimensionality, right? So you might wanna do that just for a variety of different purposes, just to be able to kind of make things a little more kind of animated, right? Less sort of static. All right, and this is you know obviously not what you'd create. I just want you to see what you can actually do with it. All right? And you've probably seen gradients across the board in many other capacities. So now our goal is to show you how you can create them. So I'm just going to delete this and go back to more or less what you may be looking at uh, when you come into InDesign. So if you look in the lower left of your toolbar here, you're gonna see this little guy right here has a little gradient. Okay. Basically, it's saying apply gradient as opposed to what? As opposed to a color. So when I click on that, I now actually switch up from solid color mode to gradient mode. Oh, that's kind of cool. Wow. So before I even like click and you know do anything right now, I should probably bring up my options for gradients. And that is going to be, again, under window. I'm going to go to color. I'm going to choose gradient. And guess what? I'm going to bring up the dreaded color panel. All right. And I want to discourage you. I understand it's a little bit kind of uh, <laughs> um, less than um, par, maybe subpar a little bit. But once you kind of harness it, you'll understand how things work. So I'm just going to go ahead and just bring this together. All right. And it's going to be very important that you kind of have these guys together so you can see how they work together. All right, it's kind of important and not super intuitive. It's important you kind of stick with me on this lesson of working with gradients and how the gradient panel works with the color panel pretty well. Now, you'll see here with my gradient panel, I have two colors here. I have my black and my white, All right? So if I were to draw something out right now, I'd have a very similar gradient that I drew out earlier with my black and my white, All right? And you'll see I can choose different types of gradients, linear, or radial, we'll explore those, the different angles. You can reverse it going from white to black and vice versa. All right, so let's just now draw it out with just using a very basic rectangle. All right, and you can say, all right, that's what that does. All right, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> and now if I then reverse it, you can see it just reverses. 
And I can change the angle too. I'm just gonna make this, let's say 90 degrees. I hit tab, all right, that's great. I'm gonna show you a little bit easier way to do that in just a second, but you can play around with this, all right? Now, what we're gonna do next is we're just gonna change the color of these, right? Let's just say you wanna make like this nice kind of blue sky or a night sky or twilight or something like that. You can do that by changing these colors here. All right, so when I choose this here, when I click on this, you'll notice how this now changes from whatever it was before, just a white or black or whatever, to the CMYK. So I'm just gonna drag this over here and drag this over there and get this nice kind of dark blue color. All right, that's pretty sweet, I like that. All right, and that was pretty easy, right? But watch what happens when I choose the black. Uh-oh, the options go away. Right, because black isn't part of that kind of CMYK discussion. It's not part of that spectrum. So when I click on this again, remember from the last lesson, my little fly up menu here, then I choose CMYK, then I'm gonna be able to actually control it. I'm gonna go over to here to just choose which color I want. And then let's make that even darker. So you can say, okay, cool, nice kind of like night sky situation. And then I reverse that, that's even better, right? Because the light's coming from above or whatever it is, right? So who knows, <laughs> okay? So just experiment with that, like where is the sun coming from, et cetera. Now, you can also control how much of which color you get as well. So you can now click on this little diamond and you see now I'm getting a little more light, right? What is that actually communicating? All right, love that, that's awesome, all right? Now, you can also add on more gradient stops if you want to. So I'm just gonna click in the middle and then make this guy just maybe go red. Ooh, that's interesting. Let's play around with my diamonds. Okay, very, very different story here. Okay, something's happening, right? A little bit different, because now I just added on a third color. All right, so let me now just go back to my selection tool. Let's make this a little bit bigger. You can see as I make this bigger, things are going to get a little bit more interesting, a little bigger canvas for me to play around with. But now, so far it's given me these kind of very sort of, you know, static options. And I can play around with the angle if I want to. I can play around with my diamond, etc. But what I'd like to do is now change kind of the direction and the kind of magnitude of my gradient. And I'm going to do that by using this guy right here called the gradient swatch tool. Everybody see where that is? The gradient swatch tool. You can find that there. And watch what that's going to do. With my shape selected, I'm gonna come over to here and I'm gonna get this crosshair as my mouse. Just watch what happens when I just click and drag going from one corner to the other. That controls my gradient. And now notice my angle is now negative 21.2 degrees. Oh, I didn't do that, but it did it for me. I click on that and notice how it's gonna change. I'm gonna to go to here. Just notice where I begin, where I end, going diagonal right here in the middle. Oh man, that's cool. It looks like a planet, right? I'm like out in outer space. Cool, whatever you wanna do, you can absolutely control this, okay? Using, guess what? This gradient swatch tool, all right? So let me just relegate this to something else. Move this over here. And now let me just do a quick little ellipse. And you're gonna see it just remembers the last thing I did. And why am I doing an ellipse this time? Doing an ellipse because I want to change my type from linear to radial. And I'm gonna reverse that. And you can see, ooh, that is very interesting. And see how radial is like a rounded gradient, which is gonna allow me to have kind of like different effects, okay? I can change the color, of course. Do whatever you wanna do. Let's do that one more time, just for some review. Let's go ahead and just go Again, kind of a lighter blue. It's gonna to go to a darker blue. All right, it's kind of nice. And you know, you can even like go a step further, add on another gradient here, and then just make that black, and you kind of have this like nice little kind of edge to it. So you kind of want to be maybe a little more artistic about this, right? It's up to you, right? Just play around with it. But then I'm gonna go over to my gradient swatch tool. 
click and drag, and let's just see what that does. All right, let me just start way off the canvas and see just a slightly, slightly different look and feel. Let me just do like kind of a perfect one like that. It's kind of nice, maybe we'll start right in the middle. What's that gonna do? Oh yeah, okay, that's kind of where I started, but just know what it's gonna do, All right? See how it's coming in from the center, going white, to a little bit darker blue, to this kind of dark purple all the way to black. So you have a lot of control to be able to then manipulate this. Now, if we look at some of our elements here, you might want to do something like that for, for this. You know, if I just change this now to a whole different look, let me just change this to linear, and I'll just make this swatch be yellow, and I'll make this be maybe a little bit of a darker yellow or a lighter yellow, whatever you want to do. And you can see, again, a little bit more kind of visual interest or it kind of like the light shines down on it. Okay, so you'll see how you have all that kind of control to be able to manipulate the look and feel, the color of your shape for a variety of different reasons. Okay, so gradients are, are really, really powerful for visual interest and for kind of drawing the audience's attention towards something you know, just make something look a little less flat, really. All right, so practice that. You may need to watch this video a few times just to get it, and then just understand how the gradient tool works in conjunction with color and how you work with the individual stops, the diamonds, how you can reverse them. And then finally, of course, working with this gradient swatch tool to then control the direction and the magnitude of that thing that you're working with. All right. So play around with that, pause your video, have fun, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back, everybody. We are now going to start talking about master pages. We've talked about regular pages so far, how to insert them, delete them, you know, just kind of navigate throughout our document. And now we're going to talk about the master pages, right? So just let's just define what a master page is, and then we're going to explore how we can sort of deconstruct this document and then even create some of our own. So master pages allow us to work with repeating elements for the most part. Like you might want to repeat a page number, right? On every single page, you want it to go from four to five to six, right? And notice how the words are repeating. Okay, that's great. You also want to repeat other things like a little design element, like a stripe or something like that. It could be a line going across, anything like that you want it to kind of repeat. Sometimes you might want to even have like a little title that you can have that go across as well. And it's always going to go in that section. But now you may have documents that are going to be contingent upon different actual masters because you want to have different things happen at different times. Could be that you're going to have blanks, right? Maybe you don't actually want to have anything on a cover page or a page that's going to have like a big map or a chart. You don't want it to be all kind of cluttered up with page numbers or you know headers and footers and things like that. So you may want to have just nothing on that master. So you're going to have to mix things up a little bit. So on the top part of our pages panel, we're going to see this section here, which is going to be all about our masters. So this particular document actually has five masters, and one is actually what's called none. But you'll notice that there's a prefix for all these, A, B, C, D, and look at this, A, B, see that, there's B, I'm gonna just highlight that for you. Let's come down a little bit more. And if we keep scrolling down, we're going to see C, and we're going to see D, okay? Now, each of these pages are linked up to some of these masters, okay? So, okay, so there's A, and that's linked up to A, that's great. Now let's take a look at B, and you will see that B is linked up to this B. But now let's get under the hood and see what in fact is going on inside of all of these. It's making these pages behave the way they are. So if I double click on this little thumbnail here, that's going to take me inside of this A master, and I'll be able to see, oh, there's some elements there. And if I go over here to the right-hand side, I'll be like, okay, there's some other elements over there. And that's all repeating across the board for everything that's linked up to those. All right, let's go ahead and go back to another one. Let's go over here to C. You can see similar. Okay, so 
Creating this document may have some similarities, may have some other things that are a little more subtle, but just understand again that they're repeating elements. Now, if I go back to my main document, I'm gonna go back to page two, and then what if I try to move this? What if I try to change the color of this? What if I just try to even basically select it? I can't do it. Let me go over to my page number. Nope, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. Why? Because it's on the master. If you wanna manipulate, edit, control any of these things that are on the master, you have to actually be in the master. You can't necessarily do it right from here. There are more advanced ways to do that. I'm gonna talk about that in our advanced class, but sometimes you might wanna have like a placeholder or something. We're gonna talk about that um, in future lessons in our advanced in design class. But for right now, let's just discuss what in fact is going on and how we can maybe manipulate this. What can we do now to maybe just make things a little more kind of interesting? Let's go back to our A master. I'm gonna double click on that. And you'll notice now I can actually click on the shape if I want to. Let me change the color of that to this nice little pretty blue color. Wonderful. All right, let me do the same thing with this guy here. Let's go over here back to that pretty blue color and do it one more time. Great, I think I'm good for now. What is that gonna do for my document? I just made a change in the master. What can you expect? Everything that's connected to this A master will now have that change. So if I look at this document now, you'll see there's blue. Come down to the bottom, there's blue and there's blue. Amazing, okay? You see how that goes across the board. Now, if I wanna go over here to B, is that affected? Nope, all right, so you'll need to understand how your masters are all constructed, what's linking up to what, so when things don't do something, you understand essentially why it's not doing something, all right? These little kind of subtle whispers to tell you that like, this in fact is only related to the A master, right? Do you see that? These are only related to the A, so we'll need to understand what's going on when things are not acting the way we want them to. All right, so let's now see how we can implement masters on another document. What do we need to do? I'm something that we've been working with, hopefully since the beginning, is working on this little cookbook. I might wanna have some running elements on all my pages, okay? Could be a basic shape like this, could be words at the bottom, and also page numbers, which I'm gonna show you how to do in just a second. Okay, so let's go to that document that we've been working on, our little cookbook here. And let's say I want to have a running page number on every part of the bottom, but I also want it to say, you know, Dave's Cayenne Cookery, right? Something like that. I want that on every single bottom of the page. You will see here, my masters, I only have one master and they're all A right now, right? And that's pretty much all I need right now, but I will show you how we can do a separate one when we create a title page. So maybe I'm gonna have an A and also another one just so I can call anything I want, just call it one, because that's going to be a title page separate from the rest of these, because I don't want a page number on it. So what I'm gonna do is go into my A master, very simply, just simply double click on it. And guess what, I'm in the master. How do I know I'm in the master? Let's take a look way down here and you will see it says A master right down there. So I know that I'm currently in the master in case you're ever confused, if you're still inside of just page one, you can just double click on a master and you're gonna see, bam, it's gonna say a master. So you know where you are. For those of us who are just, just beginning, that can be a little bit confusing because they might even look very similar to each other. So I am going to just bring in some text on the left-hand side and I'm also gonna show you how you can do a page number someplace else. So just like with anything else, I'm gonna do my text box here and just draw it out and just type out Dave's Cayenne Cookbook and whatever you want to do with that. I'll bold that and I'll make that come down a little bit more. Great. Good to go. Don't need all that right there. So I'll bring this in. All right, love it. Now that is gonna be on every single page at this point, okay? But it's gonna be 
on every single page that's on the left side of the spread. Because look where I am here. Now, if you scroll to the right, you'll be able to see the right side does not have anything at all. So these left spread and the right spread are separate and independent from each other. So we're going to work that out in just a little bit. So what's my next goal is on the right hand side, I'm going to bring in a page number. All right. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a nice little kind of uh, cheat on this. I'm just going to click on this, hold down the alt key, which we've done before, and then also hold down the shift key and just drag this over to the right hand side. So why did I do that? Because I essentially don't want to have to recreate the font. I don't want to have to recreate the alignment and all that good stuff. And this is all pretty much ready to go for me to insert a placeholder for my page numbers. Some of you may have seen earlier that your page numbers actually just had a letter in there. Like that was weird. Is it page A? How does it know what to do? That A is just a simply a placeholder for all of the pages that are connected to the A master. So what I'm going to do is just simply highlight this so it's all selected. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go over here to the type panel way up on top here, right? The type menu. And then that spills down all the way to the bottom to we have this insert special character. All right, so let's do that. So type insert special character and we'd go over here to markers and then guess what? Current page number. And what I'm going to do next is right align that. And I'm going to put the word page in front of it. Don't have to do that, but I want it to show like that. That's great. No problems there. And before I go any further, I want to check this out. What in fact is going on with my master? Is this doing what I want it to do? So guess what? Double click on the right side. What's going to happen here? Nothing. Why? Because this is on the right side of the spread. If I go over to page two and four and six, absolutely. Something should be there. I scroll down. Look at that. It knows exactly what page it is and repeats the elements of exactly what I've typed out. So let's see without all the markings. Wonderful. That's great. Love it. Love it. Love it. I'm going to go back to my master, double click on that. And now I can start building this out on this side if I want to. All right. So on this side, I'm going to take both of these elements and guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to clone them. All right, hold down the alt key and the shift key. Put that back in place. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and just scroll back over to here and let's just say 2021 edition. Cool. But I still want the page number over there on the right hand side. That's great. So let's check it out. I'm going to go back over to page one now and I'll see. Ah, there it is. OK, and I scroll down a little bit and I'll be able to see there's page two, page three, 2021 edition. All right. Well, what about these guys over here? Yep, that's still there. Love that. All right. So let's just do a couple more. Let's just do some kind of fun design elements as we showed you earlier. Let's go back to our A master. But this time, let's just draw maybe a line that's going straight across, right? Maybe it just separates it out a little bit. So I'm going to click on the little line tool and I'm going to hold down the shift key and just click and drag straight across, holding on the shift key to make it perfectly, perfectly straight. And then if I need to, I can make that go a little bit further out. Just bring that off the canvas a little bit, making sure it's thick enough. And let's check her out. How's that going to look? Going across the board, hit the W key. That's pretty good. Separates everything out. I like that. Let's take a look at this. Oh yeah, it goes across. It's exactly what I want. It's going to be on every single page just like that. All right. Now, the last thing I want to do here is now create a new master because I'm going to have a cover page in front of this that I don't want to have all that stuff on there. All right. So watch what happens. I'm going to say right click insert page. I want to do one page before page one. 
And you'll notice here that it's linking up to what master? It's linking up to the A master. And how many choices do I have? Either none or A master, right? I'm not going to choose none because I want you to just see what it's like to create a new master from scratch. You could do none, but I like to have at least something there just because I might want to add something to that, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and just say at this point, A master, it's going to be before it. And now new pages here. And that has that on there, right? Notice how it's an A. What I'm going to do is create a new master that's going to link up to this. So how do you create a new master? It's very, very easy. See this little gray area right there? Just go ahead and right click. And not too many choices here is new master. And I'm just going to call this one one. And I'm just going to call this cover. All right. That's great. And it's asking me, all right, so what is this based on? So based on any other master, you could do that. You could base it off of another master, meaning that it's going to inherit all of its features, but then you can then just sort of evolve away from that and do your own elements if you want to. So if I did do this based off of that A master, it would take all the page numbers and all that stuff, but then I can add on to that if I wanted to. But what's cool about this is that if A changes, that element that it inherited also affects this new master if you wanted to do that all right you can experiment with that in our advanced class we get into a little bit more of that stuff all right so how many of these pages do i want um i think i just want one to see what that looks like okay pretty much good to go here i'm going to click ok and you'll see this now says one cover right as opposed to a master because i named it one cover your prefix could be really pretty much anything you want now I want this guy to live here. In other words, I want page one to only have the one cover master and not the A master master. So how do I do that? Super, super easy. Just simply click, drag right on top of it. And now look at that. It says one instead of A. And now I'm going to double click on this one to go right to that page. And you'll see it's blank, all ready to go. And then if I scroll down, See, it's separate from the other ones, okay? And it's telling you it right there, all right? Now, I could then go right into here and then bring in whatever kind of content I want, build it out, put some type in there, put in an image, all that stuff. And again, it's not going to have any other elements down below, all right? Now, what I'd like to do next is change this. I don't really like calling this A master. I'm going to call it something else. I'm going to keep the A. But I don't really like that name. So what I'm going to do very simply is right click on it. A lot of options pop up for masters, right? Duplicate the master, delete the master. Maybe you want to print the master for whatever reason. Here's another option to do a new master. But what I'm going to choose is master options. And when I click on that, very simply, it gives me the choice. Well, what do you want to call it? What's the prefix you want? So I'm just going to call this a main body just like that right say okay and now look at that a main body still a and i'm ready to go just to do whatever i want from now on okay have that kind of control so if for example i was going to do a new page and i wanted it to now have just the cover in there because let's say i'm doing a new section you know if every time i do like a new recipe or something like that i'm gonna have a nice big picture on there I can very easily do that. So if I right click here, I say insert page. I only want to do one page and it's going to be after page eight. I would say that I want it to be just the one cover master, not A, because notice now I have two choices and it's going to be bam. It's going to be right here, replacing whatever page nine is. Click OK. And look at that. Now I've mixed it up one and then AAA all across the board and then fantastic. There we have it, master one cover. All right, so hopefully now you really start to see the value of this, right? Whether you're working on somebody else's document, whether you're working on um, any other documents that I presented for you, right? Looking at this document and you can see how much you can really go into creative ways and very functional ways for you as well. Whether it's page numbers, little design elements, a little bit of text, and also mixing things up a little bit 
where you might want to have something for a cover for your regular topics, right? For your regular uh, body copy and then some. So you'll want to experiment with it. You'll know kind of what your documents are sort of dictating. So pause the video, practice that, really understand how we can change our masters, create our masters, apply our masters, get into the masters, tinker with them, bring in page numbers, and maybe you have some other creative ideas. So I'd love to see some of your comments in the chat and um, we will see you in the next exercise, but practice up, pause the video and have fun. Now, hopefully at this point, you are comfortable enough with InDesign to start making some preference changes of your own. You're starting to learn a little bit more about the program as far as what you want things to look like, your units of measure, the color, and maybe you're starting to see some kind of like funkiness around InDesign in terms of like how your computer is performing. Maybe you want to get into some like spell check options and you want maybe things to be a little bit more like Word or something like that. And it's not. Maybe some of you don't want it to be like Word at all. <laughs> okay, so let's just see what we can do just to tinker a little bit with some of our preferences. And this will be something that you'll go back to time and time again as you start to learn more about the program, right? And then some of these things you'll probably never look at because they're pretty good or it might just be like way beyond any of your needs. So how do you get to your preferences? If you're on a PC, you simply just go to edit and then preferences down here and you'll see here's all of our options. If you're on a Mac, you simply go over here to the InDesign menu in the upper left and choose preferences. So I'm gonna to go to preferences and I'm gonna go over to here to interface. And you can see here, these are my preferences for my interface. What does that mean? I can now change this to this kind of nice darker one. I can go medium light. I can go a little bit brighter. So you do have all those nice options for you to work with, right? Depending on you know, what your preferences are. Okay, that's why we're in preferences. Okay, you can also see you can match your pasteboard to the theme color. So it's going to then kind of blend in a little bit kind of smoother as you do that, right? As you're working with these, you might want that, but sometimes you can make it harder to see. So totally up to you. All right. Now you'll also see a few other options as far as our panels are concerned. Okay. Do you want some of these panels to auto hide? Do you want to open up as tabs? Do you want them to be large tabs or not? So you'll be able to see if I click on large tabs, notice how that shrinks down a little bit, right? I'll bring that back and you say, okay, fantastic. Right. If I click on that one, right? You see it says open documents as tabs. Next time you start opening them up, they will not be as tabs, they'll be as separate windows, okay? Again, totally up to you. And also one of the first things we did was make our floating tools panel as a double column. But again, totally up to you. Maybe you want it to be a single row. Maybe you want it to be just a single column, all right? So that's gonna be able to be effective very easily as well. All right, let's come over here to our units and increments, right? So some of you in the beginning maybe had to change from, you know, picas or millimeters or pixels or whatever, remember where you were at before and you didn't like it, you can always make a permanent change to make it be what you want it to be, right? So in other words, if it always comes with picas, I can change this to inches and respective to all these other ones do the same thing. Now, understand that if you want to make a global change, you should have no documents open when you do this. Right? Very important, because if you make a change right now, it's only gonna affect that particular document. So you should have nothing open, then go make your change. That said, if you open up a document that was previously created using PICAs, you're still gonna have to make the changes, okay? And you, of course you can do it from here, but also I showed you how you can right click in this little nexus and then it'll change to whatever that unit of measure is going to be, All right? You'll see also, I like this one here is this cursor key because I like to nudge things. What does that mean? With my cursor, if I want something to move, if I just kind of nudge with my arrows, it's just gonna go that far. And maybe some of you have already seen me do this, but when you hold down the shift key while tapping on the arrow keys, you'll see that it's actually gonna go 10 times farther than whatever these settings are. All right, so if you want it to be very, very precise, you would make this part smaller. All right, so of course you'll experiment with that. All right, let's take a look also at our spelling. All right, you can see here, find what? When you're doing a spell check, what do you want it to do? Find misspelled words, repeated words, etc. Maybe some of these things you don't care about, so you can just very much 
uncheck them. You also see here is the option for dynamic spelling. Some of you may actually have this unchecked. So therefore, it's not actually giving you a red squiggly line as you're bringing in and typing out misspelled words, but some of you may want that. And that's kind of coming back to like how Word does it by default. You may not have that checked, so therefore it is not going to give you the little red squiggly line. All right, and you can see some other options as well. And maybe you don't want it in red, you want it in magenta, you want it in violet, whatever it is, you have all those options. Now also is this autocorrect option. Okay. Do you want it to autocorrect for you based off of all these millions and millions of words that it has in its dictionary? Usually by default, this is not selected. So if you want it to do that, you can absolutely, absolutely enable this. All right. And then um, maybe one or two other things here is this a uh, display performance. All right. If your computer is running like too fast or too slow, because you have two heavy documents right that are running in your system as you are building off this document because you have like you know these like massive massive files and InDesign is still having to link up to these it could actually show something that's very very high resolution and then still slow down your computer even though you're linking up you want to check that out all right so you can actually make some changes to that so you can say hey listen just show me the fast view but then when you finally do publish it, when you do package it, it's going to give you the high quality. This is just for your viewing. How do you want to do that? Okay. And I'll show you in a second how we can do that kind of um, on the fly as well if you ever need to do that. Okay. So typical could be good for you, but it all depends on your computer's processing power. All right. So definitely check that out. Have fun with it. All right. Now let's also go to file handling. You will see here file handling. Some things might you might be interested in is okay, number of recent items to display, 20, maybe more, maybe less, totally up to you. You'll also see that there's this really nice option to create links when placing text and spreadsheet files. Earlier, we talked about links by linking up images. You might want to also have links where you can see, hey, somebody brought in a Word file or an Excel sheet, something like that, you might want to see how that has been brought in, if it's been brought in, where it lives, all that good stuff. And it's gonna show in the links panel. By default, this is not chosen. So if you want it to be shown, then you will need to check this box. All right, so let's just see a couple of things now on the front end. I'm gonna click OK. And once you see where we're gonna find our options for spell check. If you click on edit, you'll see about a little more than halfway down is the option for spelling. And you can see here is dynamic spelling and autocorrect is checked because that's what I have it set up in my preferences. You can then do check spelling right now if you like, and it's gonna run you through a little spell check. And it's gonna be hopefully familiar to you if you've worked in any other spell check program before, and you just go right through it, take the suggestions or leave it, totally up to you. And finally click done. And you also notice that under edit is a few other options like find and replace. We did a few exercises on that before with our character styles. Okay, so pretty nice. Just play around with all these to um, experiment and definitely use those uh, to make sure you have no spelling mistakes. And the other thing I told you about is the ability to work with um, our images. Okay, so earlier we talked about how the fact that sometimes our images are going to come in. Let me just go ahead and do so. Control zero come over to this side here. And earlier we talked about our display handling of our images, because sometimes things are not coming in good, sometimes they are, and we wanna be able to see it at the best quality, because I just need to know, is this really good? Is this as good as it can be? And if you recall from our links discussion, we can see, hey, this particular document is 6.7 megabytes, right? Which is pretty big, it's also 300 PPI, Okay, so it should be coming in good quality, but it could also be making my computer run a little slow. So if I right click on this, you'll see way down at the bottom is this display performance. And you can see it's using the view setting. But if I've got a lot of these, it could certainly be clogging up my system. So I might want it just to be a fast display. Okay, and then, uh oh, that's not very good. So I can just undo that. I'll just do typical display 
or maybe you're going to do high quality display. All right, so of course the fast display just kind of took it all away, right? Okay, well, if you ever see a document like this, you'll know like, oh wait, is there nothing there? Or did somebody just turn off the display performance from typical and high quality and I could always bring it back. So that's just kind of a good little tip to know about in case your computer's running a little bit slow or you wanna see the image better or somebody else may have turned it off because their computer is running slow. All right, so just a lot of things to just really configure on your system. Now that we know a little bit more, I encourage you to go into the preferences and explore on your own to see, you know, what is gonna jump off the page for you really experiment with them and just go back maybe every once or two, three weeks after you learn more and more about InDesign because some of these things will become more relevant for you. All right, so pause the video, practice this, and we come back, we're gonna learn how to export and package our document. Welcome, welcome, and welcome back. Here we are at the end of the class where we are going to learn about how to export and package and publish. So we finished our document, here we are, and we're ready to send it to the printer. We're ready to make it into a PDF and we wanna publish it on our website. We wanna send out an email with our PDF. All kinds of great things we can do. Now, before we do anything, we need to make sure that everything is good to go. All right, we've talked about a few of those things and how we do that. So what we wanna make sure of is that we got no errors, all right? So how can we even tell if we have errors at all? If you look down on the bottom, you will always see this pre-flight, okay? So hopefully at this point, your eyes have been trained to always look down here to see like, hey, wait a second, do I have any problems? If I were to publish this right now, is my printer gonna have problems? Is the quality gonna come in? Is some of my text gonna get cut off? You really wanna be asking yourself these questions. And then the follow-up question, of course, is how do I fix it? What do I do? So InDesign is here to help. If I double click on this right now, it's gonna take me to, guess what? My pre-flight panel telling me what my issues are. So you can see here is links. I have 57 mixing links. Oh my God, that's gonna take me forever. Some of you may see something that says like text and overset text. You're gonna see that when you have like the little red plus sign that's telling us like, hey, some of that text is like just not showing, right? Your, your text box is too small. So you gotta resolve that, right? And you'll figure out ways to do that. Maybe you add on a new page. Maybe you make the line spacing a little more narrow. Maybe you make your images smaller. Lots of different ways to deal with that. But we're gonna focus on this part here because we need to make sure that our links, i.e. in this case, our images are all set up ready to go and ready to be packaged with our file. Because when we send it to our printer, our printer needs to see the actual images, so then therefore they can print it in the best, highest quality possible, all right? So when we package it, it's gonna come with our images. You'll see then just a little bit. So you can see again, I have all these missing links. Oh, what am I gonna do? No problem. Let's go over here to our links panel. And if you don't have this here, you can always go over here to window and then links and then bam, there you are. There's all of our links. And this is a little review from one of our previous lessons of what do we do? How do we relink these to make it so we can ensure that everything's gonna come in um, accordingly? So let me go to like my bouquet right here and you'll see here is this little guy right there to relink. Okay, so I click on that and it's gonna take me to my file explorer, whatever yours is, and you'll kinda need to know more or less where this image lives. Right, so it's gonna help you relink it to where they've been moved to because your coworker moved it or renamed it or something like that. You're just relinking it because it somehow got lost. So what I'm gonna do before I even click on this is I'm gonna make sure that this is unchecked right here, this show import options. And this in fact is checked right here, this search for missing links in this folder. 
okay? Because when I find Bouquet, I also want to find all of Bouquet's friends, right? All these guys here, the Tulip and the TOC, et cetera, et cetera. So let's uncheck Show Import Options. Don't really need that. So I'm going to keep going, keep going. Oh, there's Bouquet. Yep, and it looks just like what I'm looking for. I can see that. And then just simply double click on it and then watch this. Relink, relink, and it's doing the other thing I asked it to do. Waiting for it and then what, what, what? Search this link. Oh my God, it found and relinked 56 missing links. Oh, oh my God, that is amazing. Click OK. Wait for it. No more pesky question marks and get out of here. No errors. That is amazing. Oh my God, I'm so happy and I'm ready to go. All right, so definitely check that out. Now, what are the next steps for us to do? If I'm just making this into a PDF, let's just see what our steps are here. I'm gonna go over here to my export options here. I click on file, export, and you can see this is gonna come up. What do you want to save this as? Okay, so totally up to you. I'm just gonna go ahead and save this as a PDF, print, right? And then I'll just call this final HP doc. That's amazing. I click on save. And now, whoa, thought I was done. A lot more stuff comes up here. A lot more stuff comes up here. Basically asking me, what kind of quality do you want it to do? What, when you open it up into a PDF, how do you want it to show up, right? Compression levels, there's a million things you can change here. So let's just go over like a half a million of these, <laughs> okay? So you can see here my compatibility, right? What compatibility do you want it to be in? I usually just change the highest, right? I usually choose just the highest, okay? That's great. And then you'll see here, okay, so what page ranges do I want to save it in? Okay, so I can just do all my pages or only certain pages, absolutely can do that. You'll also notice that there is a viewing section here of when I create my PDF, how do you want it to be shown? Do you want it to just fit the page? You want it to be certain percentages, things like that. So when somebody does open it up, how do you want it to view? Because maybe you want it to be kind of open up like a book. Maybe you want it to kind of fit perfectly. However you want to do that, you have that option to do that. I'll notice here's also full screen mode. All right. And then in the future, you may be working with bookmarks and hyperlinks, right? And a few of these other things, right? And in our advanced class, we do get into hyperlinks and bookmarks. So I strongly encourage you to go there um, after this to learn some more. But you can see if you're working with those, you can just say, yes, I want those as well. Now let's go over to here to compression. And you can see compression is typically gonna be about images. When you have like big fat images, you might wanna actually compress them, right? Because it's like, oh, this is gonna be emailed to everybody. I wanna compress them. So you can see here's a section for color images. Here's a section for grayscale images, monochrome images, okay? And here's the option for, well, what kind of like bicubic downsampling do you want to do or whatever you want to do here for images above a certain amount of PPI for all of these, for color, grayscale, etc. So if something is very, very large, you just want to downsample it, okay? And you'll see here also, here's some options for compression, image quality, etc. So you'll know what is right for you. Maybe you don't want to do anything at all, so maybe you just leave it be. Now let's go over here to our marks and bleeds. In our first lesson, we did talk about all the different marks, right? And all of our, our slugs and everything like that, saying about, hey, this is where information is going to go for your printer and for yourself maybe even, that you might want these things showing up here. So if I say all printers marks, all these things will show up. And it's just information, right? You might not want to print it, so it'll probably get sliced off if it's just like an eight and a half by 11, but you might need that information just for you know proofs and things like that, all right? Here's all my document bleed settings, okay? So again, you might be setting it to be, as I suggested, the 0.125, again, totally up to you. And then if you want to include this in there as you're printing it, please go ahead and do that. All right, let's take a look at a few other things. If you are working with any kind of like color conversion, you'll probably know when the time comes that you are doing that, right? So you might be converting it from CMYK to RGB and vice versa. This is gonna be the place for you to do it. And we'll skip this part for now. And we're gonna go over here to security. 
very, very important because you might want to password protect your document. So very simply require a password to open the document. Great. I could do that and just type in your password. And then here is use a password to restrict printing or editing or other tasks. So absolutely you can do that. And then you have a whole bunch of other options here in terms of what you're going to allow to have happen. All right. So this could also be something that you do in advanced class. Like we're going to learn about how to create forms and a few other interactive things. So you might want to be able to do that. I'm going to keep mine as is for right now. And it's going to give me a nice little summary of what I've done. I can review this if I want to, I can save the summary and it'll give me a nice little output of that. All right. Now, You'll notice on the bottom is this save preset. You'll also notice up on top, there is this Adobe PDF preset. And it says that I have a high quality print preset that's been modified. Okay. So when you first start, when you do this, there is a preset that you may be starting with that you may just love. And it could be any one of these that you're working with. Okay. So notice I modified what they first gave me but I could go back to the original and it's gonna go back to what was the pre-modified one. And you'll also see here is press quality, which is very, very high quality. Here's smallest file size, which is going to compress those images for you, okay? And then these are ones that I've actually done in the past that are presets that I named these, okay? You probably will not have these, all right? So for our purposes, we did do some modifications. So let's save this because I might wanna use this over and over and over again. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to, just going to call this DC HP long doc settings. Great. I click OK. And then I'm just going to simply say export because I am now ready to rock and roll with this. And you'll see over here in the upper right here, very subtly that this is just exporting. It's doing its thing. It's got to wait for it. You can see when you click on it, it gives you the percentage and the status of what's happening. Okay. And that in fact has been saved. So let's verify where that was saved and we'll be able to open it up into PDF. So I go back into the file where I saved it. There it is. Final HP doc. I click on that to open it up and there it is looking very pretty. Exactly how I planned it out to be. That's great. Let's go ahead and bring this down a little bit. I can see everything there. Fantastic. Looks amazing. So this has now been saved as a PDF. Okay. We have not packaged it yet. Technically speaking, we just saved this as a PDF. So maybe you are done and that is all you need to do with this exercise, but there's going to be times when you need to package your content because you're going to send it to a printer. So if I click on file, I'm going to come way down to the bottom. I'm going to say package and you'll see here, it's going to give me a little, so a little summary of like how many fonts I'm using, all the steps here. If you want to use that, you can even choose this box to say, create printing instructions. We'll do that in just a minute. Okay. Click on fonts. You'll be able to see all the fonts you're using very much like just information at this point, because at this point, presumably you have cleaned up everything. You've looked at your errors and you said, okay, you know what? There's no font issues here. There's no link issues here. There's no overset text issues here. I click on that. Okay. So no issues here. Okay. That looks amazing. And if you're seeing too much stuff here, you can say show problems only, right? And it'll show you maybe what the problems are. Okay. And then you can see here is all my colors. Okay. Nothing too fancy here, right? At this point, we're actually pretty good. So I click on package. I'm going to save it. And then here are my instructions. Kind of cool, right? So I can say, all right, here is me. All right. And then there we are. Here's my address. Okay. And then put in my phone number. Very important, right? Because you might want to have people contact you, right? So Dave at sftech.com. Okay. Instructions. Contact me if there are any issues. Click on continue. And now this is very interesting because what it's going to allow me to do is now not only package this ready to go, but I can package it based off of guess what? One of my settings that I just saved 
for my PDS savings, or I can actually do it as any one of these also if I want to. So it's linking up to the last thing I just showed you, even though that was a PDF, it's also now packaging it, and I can choose those same preset settings that I saved from earlier and apply them here as I'm doing this, okay? And then you'll wanna just kind of pick and choose some of these things as well, include fonts and links from hidden and non-printing content, Probably not, probably not necessary. Okay, copy linked graphics. Yep, you wanna do all that good stuff there. Okay, you're good to go. You could certainly choose your um, instructions if you want to, to kind of replay them to see if you've done them right. And then make sure you know exactly where you're saving it. So I'm gonna go right back to my folder, go back into here and then click on package. And then this is basically a message about some copyright stuff. So I'm gonna say don't show again and click okay. And you can see, bam, it's packaging, 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 creating the PDF, an InDesign file, it's putting everything together. So my printer has everything they need to see and publish my content without any issues. And hopefully they're not gonna call me, but if they wanna call me, they got my instructions that they can contact me anytime. Okay, so let's now go ahead and check out that folder. And we will see, I now have a new folder living inside of the folder that I just put it inside of. And there it is, 03HP long dot class folder. That's great, I open that up and you'll be able to see, wonderful, there is everything. Here are my instructions. Here's my InDesign file. Here's my PDF. Here are my links. Wait, we talked about links, didn't we? Click on that and guess what? Oh, that's why that was so important because my printer needed to see all of those, right? They need to actually run with them. And then when they do print it out, the printer is actually reading these things and feeding into it, okay? And then here's all my fonts. In case my printer does not have my fonts, now they do, okay? So I've now said, hey, you can have this font library. I don't care, all right? So let's come back to InDesign really kind of digest everything we did here really it's understanding the processes the importance of every step in the way all the way from going from pre-flighting looking at whether all of your links are set up you have any overset text if you don't have the right fonts by the way you can always go to type and you can say uh, find your fonts okay if necessary you can see you can uh, get your fonts if necessary from here and of course you can do it directly from the pre-flight if you need to. And all the things that we did in terms of our PDF presets for quality, for security, for how you want your PDF to be shown. Okay, so, so many, so many different variables to keep in mind when you're saving as a PDF and also notice how that overlaps when you're packaging it and you're sending it to the printer. Okay, so again, pause the video, make sure you get this, you can either use our files here or use one of your own, but this is something you're all invariably going to be working with. Okay, so practice up, have fun, and good luck. Thank you for watching, everyone. This concludes our intro to InDesign class. Now, we covered a lot in this class. We learned how to create documents from scratch, drawing, manipulating, and coloring shapes, how to place and enhance images, work with frames, strokes, and layers. We also covered object effects and how to save and implement object styles. We also learned how to work with all of the amazing typographical features that InDesign has to offer, including how to save both paragraph and character styles. And at this point, you should be comfortable with working with master pages, and finally, how to publish and package your documents. Now, there's a lot more to InDesign to learn, so please check out our other video on Advanced InDesign where we tackle even more complex features that this amazing program has to offer. Thank you again and hope to see you in the next class. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit LearnIt.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.